Right, call the meeting to order. Sergeant Adams, please invite the first uh, witness to the witness table. Please take your seat, Ms. Lowe. Thank you. For the record, uh, please state your name, your occupation, and the positions you hold. Hi, my name is Lo Ping. I am the head and co-founder of a data viz and editorial studio based in Singapore called Continentalist. Um, in the Workers' Party, I'm a cadre member, and prior to her resignation, I was secretarial assistant to Ms. Farisa Khan. Okay, thank you. Now, the evidence you'll be giving today before the committee will be taken on oath or affirmation, and if you so desire, you can also take an affirmation. So, clerk, please administer the oath. I, Lo Peying, do solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence which I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please be seated. Now, the Committee of Privileges is looking into the complaint made by the Leader of the House, Ms. Indrani Raja, against former member of Seng Kang GRC, Ms. Reza Khan, for breach of privilege. So thank you very much again for attending today's hearing to give evidence before the committee and to answer the questions which members of the committee would like to put to you. Now, you have taken a solemn obligation to answer our questions truthfully, and you are under oath or affirmation. And if you refuse to answer our questions directly or attempt to mislead the committee, such behaviour will be an offence and in contempt of this committee. Uh, I'll now call on Mr. Edwin, Minister Edwin Tong to raise his questions. Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Lo. Thank you very much for coming to assist with the COP proceedings. We will, as you heard from Chairman, Ms. Khan is facing an inquiry into some untruths that were spoken in Parliament and also a failure to substantiate those untruths. That's the substance of the leader's complaint, which this COP is looking into. Ms. Khan in Parliament had admitted to those untruths this COP, however, needs to understand the circumstances in which those untruths came to be spoken, the statements came to be made in Parliament. And one of our tasks is to assess the context to determine the culpability of Ms. Khan. Because one of the things we have to do is to make findings, which are factual, and also make recommendations as to the appropriate sanctions. So I'll be asking you questions in that context to elicit from you the background circumstances and the context which led up to the statements, the various statements being made. Where relevant, uh, I will also ask you to expand on some of the questions and uh, the answers that you give to help us to understand the context as well. And also, if there are other people who might be able to assist the committee in relation to the questions that I raised with you, please do inform us. Not okay. Thank you. Now, um, Ms. Lo, you mentioned earlier that you, until her resignation, was the secretarial assistant to Ms. Khan. Mm. That would have been since July 2020, correct? That's right. Prior to that, you were also secretarial assistant to Mr. Pritam Singh. Would that be right? That's correct. That's for a period of about three years from March 2013 to January 2016. Correct. What led you to step down from that role in January 2016? Um, just... General fatigue. I was quite tired, yeah. Okay, I understand. You are presently the head and co-founder of Continentalist. Mm, that's right. And you're also on its editorial team. Uh, yes, I am. You were also previously freelance editor of Trip.com. Um, very, very briefly, yeah. Okay. And for a period, you were also a curatorial research assistant at the ACM. Correct. In the context of your role... Uh, as a secretary assistant, which I'll call SA for short. Yeah. Uh, 
and you've played this role for several years with different members of parliament. Can you give us a broad description of your duties? What do you do? Um, on both instances, to both Mr. Pritam Singh and Ms. Farisa Khan, my role as a secretarial assistant was confined quite strictly to just um, organising their Meet the People session. And that includes um, helping to roster volunteers for the Meet the People session and also help to draft letters that will be sent to various agencies. Mm -hmm. In particular to Ms. Khan, for the past one year or so, can you describe this role in more detail? Um, it's exactly what I've described. I help her roster um, volunteers to be present at the Meet the People session, and I also help to um, you know, prepare the letters that will be sent to various government agencies, and that includes verifying factual information, occasionally speaking to residents um, to confirm details, and etc. Yeah. Besides this, does Ms. Khan discuss matters with you pertaining to the Workers' Party? Yes, she does. Can you give us an idea of what those matters might be? Um, time to time, Ms. Khan will share with me, um, for example, on occasion, if she needs my, on, my assistance on some speeches, she might ask me to help take a look or help with some research matters. Um, and also just sort of miscellaneous party affairs, like if there's a meeting, etc. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you would regard that as part of your duties as an essay as well? Um, not quite. I see it as um, my capacity as a member of the Workers' Party and as a volunteer of the Workers' Party. And presumably as a cadre member as well. That's right. Ms. Khan made a number of speeches and also asked a couple of PQs and raised supplementary questions in Parliament. You would be familiar with some of them? She would have discussed it with you? Only some. Generally, from my understanding, Ms. Khan works on all of her PQs and her speeches on her own. understand. When she does discuss her speeches and PQs with you, give me a sense of what the nature of those discussions would be. Um, it's just to have another set of eyes to look over her speech to make sure that, um, I guess, the speech is sound. Um, and to sometimes if she has, um, I guess, um, some research materials that she wants a second person to verify and confirm facts and figures that's out there for public consumption. Um, and ensuring that you know the speech reads clearly and is easy to understand. And also accurately conveys the points that the speech intends to make? Uh, yes. What about after speeches are made or PQs are asked in Parliament? Is there a review? Uh, no, not with me. Is there a discussion as to what, what are the learning points? Not with me. Not with you. Are you aware if these discussions are held with anybody in the Workers' Party? Um, I only have second-hand information of what's been told to me, and I believe that um, the MPs review sometimes um, after a session. Do the MPs review before the speeches are made? Um, I believe the MPs um, do sort of share speeches with each other prior to making them in Parliament mm -hmm. and give each other comments, yes. You are familiar with a statement made by an uh, ex-member member of Parliament from Workers' Party, Mr. Daniel Goh, in relation to his suggestion or his own knowledge that MPs usually share speeches and there is a consensus reached on the speeches. Would that be your understanding as well? Um, I can't confirm this because I'm not part of that process. So I don't know to what degree they confirm on the speeches, I but I do know that they sort of review it together. I'm just asking you from the perspective of your own personal knowledge, so I'm not asking you to second yeah. guess what other people might or might not have done. But from what you know, is that process followed? Yes. So the process that Mr. Goh described where there is a consensus prior to a speech being delivered, that would be followed? Yes. And are you aware if anyone else outside of members of parliament are involved in the process? I mean, for example, there will be speech writers Assist, assisting each of the members of parliament? Um, to my knowledge, Mr. Pritam Singh has two legislative assistants, which he was entitled to hire after being appointed as leader of the opposition. And to my knowledge, they are the only two that are involved. I don't know anyone else. You don't know of anyone else? Yeah. But there could be? I don't know. <laughs> okay. yeah. In the context of the speeches that you do assist Ms. Khan with, can you give me an idea as to what the process is. How is that done? 
usually she's already done with the speech and it's either the day before or the morning off that she asked me to just take a quick look. And uh, how are those comments conveyed to Ms Khan? Uh, over WhatsApp, I'll just give her my thoughts. Okay. And uh, do you get to see the various iterations of the speech and do you give your view uh, how the drafts turn around? No, I don't. You don't? Yeah. Besides speeches made in Parliament, do you also assist Ms Khan with speeches made outside of Parliament? Um, Say at events or... Um, no, I don't. Um, yeah, I don't. But I, I, I occasionally assist her with, again, she's already drafted, for example, like a social media post. Mm -hmm. And I just help to review it and ensure that, again, it's understand, easy to understand, you know, grammar's correct, etc. So yeah. social media on Facebook or Instagram yeah. or any of these other channels. Yeah. Understand. So y you would generally be through these touch points, be broadly familiar with the kind of approach that Ms Khan takes, the views that she holds, the approach that she would take in conveying her views both in Parliament as well as on social media channels. Would it be fair to say that? Um, I, I, I guess I can't really say that I would be, you know, 100% cognizant of, of yeah, her intentions, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Now, you would be familiar that on the 3rd of August, uh, Ms Khan made a speech. Yes. Uh, that was in the context of a uh, motion that was moved by the Workers' Party, Ms yeah. Her and uh, Mr Pereira, yeah. were the movers of the motion. And before we get to the portions of the speech that concern the... Uh, that the leader of the house had raised, you will remember that two other points Ms Khan made was on female genital mutilation and mm -hmm. on Muslim marriages. Yeah. Were you familiar with those topics and did she discuss that with you? Not at all. She did not discuss those with me. So you're not familiar with how it was drafted or who drafted it? Yes. Um, that particular speech I had no involvement in. Do you know who had involvement in? No, I do not. You have no idea? No. It was made without your knowledge, or did you know that there's such a speech would be made? No, I did not know that such a speech would be made. Did you know that such a motion was being moved? Yeah, I was aware that the party was moving a motion. And uh, did you not discuss with Ms Khan whether she'll be making a speech on N that motion? No, I did not discuss with her. And she didn't raise that with you either? No. Are you familiar with anyone who might have assisted Ms Khan in relation to that speech? No. You, the no means you are not familiar or no one else assisted her with that speech? No, I'm not familiar. So there might have been someone, but you just don't know? Yeah. What about after the speech was made? Do you, were you aware of any discussions that Ms Khan might have had with anyone after the speech was made? Uh, yes, I have information on that. Okay. So let's take it step by step. Did she discuss the speech with you after it was made? Yes, she did. Can you tell us the substance of the discussion? Starting, um, sorry, I'm sorry to in interrupt. Starting with when that took place. Yeah. The reference point being that the speech was made on the 3rd of August. Yeah. Um, I first came to learn that she had made the speech on the midnight of the 3rd of August itself. Um, I was late to check my phone messages and... I saw, I guess, um, the discussion and the commotion happening following the news. Um, and thereafter, I gave her my thoughts on the matter. Um, and I know that she had also discussed with um, uh, Mr. Pritam Singh on the matter. On the 3rd of August itself? I believe so, yes. All right. What thoughts did you give to Ms. Khan on the 3rd of August? Um, at the time, I had also the same information as the public, which I had the understanding that she had accompanied um, this um, survivor to the police station. And I advised her that because it's important to protect the survivor's confidentiality, that she should not share um, information about the victim's identity because I didn't think that was the right thing to do. Right. By the time you spoke with her, had you seen the speech? 
not in full. I, I like to show you a copy of the speech, an extract of the speech, so that we are all on the same page. Yeah. Right. Um, may I, Mr. Chairman, have the clerk hand out a copy of the extract of the speech made by Ms. Khan yes, on please. the 3rd of August? Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, as a matter of housekeeping, uh, there might be several documents that we tender. So can I suggest that for identification purposes, we mark them? And perhaps we mark them sequentially, we call them COP 1, 2, 3, and so on. Yes, we can do that for easier reference. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Lowe, the opening page is the starting point of the motion being moved by Ms. Her. If you would just look at the bottom right-hand corner, you will see the page numbers. Could I please refer you to page 90? Do you see that? That's the start of Ms. Khan's speech. She raises various points about sexual violence, in the fourth paragraph, sexual assault cases, talking about what happened in the case of a South Korean female air force officer. And over the page, you will see the paragraph that I'd like you to focus on, which starts with, in my line of work. Do you see that? Yes. So she says, I've accompanied people to police stations to make reports on sexual violence. It is already incredibly difficult for survivors to feel comfortable making a report in the first place. But sometimes the responses from those called to protect us can be disheartening. Three years ago, I accompanied a 25-year-old survivor to make a police report against a rape that was committed against her. She came out crying. The police officer had allegedly made comments about her dressing and the fact that she was drinking. This would have been one of the paragraphs that you had discussed with her in your call on the 3rd of August, correct? Uh, I did not call her on the 3rd of August. How did you discuss this with her then? On WhatsApp. On WhatsApp. So the nature of the discussions that you had with her on WhatsApp would have centred on this paragraph, amongst others? Um, yes. You told us that you said to her that it is important to ensure that the confidentiality of the individual be protected. Yeah. Was that the only point you made to her? Um, that was the primary point. Would you still have those WhatsApp messages and exchanges with Ms. Khan? Um, yeah, I do. Yes. Uh, it, over the course of this session, to the extent relevant, and Mr. Chairman will determine that, I will make a request for the production of some documents. And so, in relation to this series of WhatsApp chats, I'd like to make a request that you produce them to the COP. Okay. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> now, at that point in time, did you ask Ms. Khan whether this occasion actually happened? No, because I also believe that it was true. Did she share with you that she was not able to substantiate this account? Um, I had what information she shared with Parliament, which that she cannot contact the survivor anymore. So, at, as of 3rd of August, what you knew was what was said in Parliament? That's right. Right. Over the course of your subsequent discussions with her, did that view change? Mm, I don't understand what you mean. The 3rd of August midnight was when you first had an exchange of messages with Ms. Khan over this speech. Yeah. And you are telling us that as of that time, your state of knowledge was exactly as what she had said in Parliament. So you only knew the material that was public. Mm -hmm. But you also would have engaged in subsequent discussions with her. Mm. Correct? Yes, correct. So at it... At any point thereafter, did your view change? Did you come to learn that this fact or this anecdote was not true? Yes, I did. At what stage did you learn that? Um, on the 7th of August, in the evening, Ms. Farisa Khan had WhatsApped uh, me and another party uh, colleague to say that she had done something bad. Um, and then we had hopped on a Zoom call to discuss this, and that's when she told me of the truth. Can you... Briefly describe the tenor of the WhatsApp discussion that you had with her on the 7th of August. It sounded serious, um, and I was willing to uh, listen to her um, and also 
show my concern for her as both a friend and as a party colleague. Yeah. Of course. Can you give us a gist of the messages that you exchanged with her on the 7th of August? Um, it was really short. She just said that she had done something bad um, and I asked her what it was and then she um, she did say that, um, that at that point of time, she did say that there were only two people who knew of what this was um, and she said her husband and Mr. Pritam Singh. You said that thereafter you hopped onto a Zoom discussion. Yeah. Can you tell us who was on the Zoom discussion? Myself um, and uh, Mr. Yudhishthira Nadan. With Ms. Khan? That's right. Who is Mr. Yudhishthira Nadan? He's also a cadre member of the Workers' Party. Can you tell us a little bit more about Mr. Nadan? Um, what more do you want to know? I mean, was he a secretarial assistant as well? Did mm, to my knowledge, he didn't, he didn't hold any legislative or secretarial assistant posts, but he was briefly, I think, a member of the Workers' Party Youth Wing, um, the uh, part of the executive committee of the Workers' Party Youth Wing. So, to your knowledge, what was his role in the context of this speech? Just as a friend. Uh, so, in other words, not having been involved initially in the speech, but yeah. subsequently given that there was a realisation that there was a problem, in your words, a serious problem, he got involved. Maybe I can add some points to clarify this. Yes, Myself, great. Mr. Nadan and Ms. Khan, we have a WhatsApp group together where we often um, just discuss things in general. Yeah. And would Mr. Nadan be one where Ms. Khan would bounce ideas off and discuss generally? Generally, yes. So would it include speeches, approaches, political points, strategy... And so on? Yes, but not this particular speech. Not prior to not her prior. making the speech. Yeah. But certainly after. Yeah. There would have been quite a an active discussion subsequent to the speech, would you say? Yes. In the days after 3rd of August? Um, yes. So that culminated in the 7th of August and you said there was a Zoom discussion? Yes. Can you give us the gist of the Zoom discussion? Um, she told us that... Um, she had lied because she was once a victim herself, a survivor herself of sexual assault. She relayed to us that this had happened when she was overseas, when she was 18, um, and that she had sought, um, I guess, to heal uh, from this episode by attending support groups. And that's when she learned of this anecdote. And she told us that she could not share... Um, the circumstances of her learning of this anecdote because she also did not want to reveal that she was a member of this support group and therefore also that she's a victim of sexual assault. But she made clear to yourself and Ms. Nathan, Mr. Nathan, I beg your pardon, that the anecdote was false. Yeah, that's right. And that she was not able to substantiate it. That's right. What was your reaction? I was shocked. Of course, um, and very disappointed, yeah. What did you advise her to do? Um, at that point of time, my primary points to her was as a friend. Um, I did not advise her to take any particular course of action. I just listened and maintained her confidentiality because she was a survivor of a sexual assault. I mean, there, there are a couple of issues which would have been germane at that point in time. Hmm looking at it from your perspective and just putting together the evidence that you've just given us. You've come to learn of it for the first time. Mm. You obviously want to protect someone whom you regard not just as a member of parliament and a fellow party member, but also a friend, as you say. And you therefore are keen to ensure that she is also protected given her own experience. I, I assume that's one perspective that you had that, that day. My protection, my desire to so-called protect her was only to protect her confidentiality as a victim of sexual assault, not in any other way. Were you concerned that a statement had been made in Parliament that was not true? Yes, I was concerned. And did you give her any views on that? Um, I didn't feel a need to because, as I said, at that point of time when she told me, I also had knowledge that our party leader, um, Pritam Singh, already knew and it didn't feel like I needed to take any further action on that. 
I'll come to that in a moment. But would you be able to describe Mr. Nathan's reaction on this Zoom discussion? Um, First I mean, of all, let me back up a little bit. Mm. You said there's a group chat. So can you describe Mr. Nathan's responses on this group chat in relation to the discovery that what was said on the 3rd of August was not true? He had similar views to me, I believe. I can't recall the exact exchange because, as you said, it was quite animated um, and active. Animated on the WhatsApp chat? Yeah, it, I mean, I'll be honest, lah, it, was, it was animated. We obviously felt that, um, we felt bad for her that she was, for, I mean, questioned subsequently. Um, and we wanted to comfort her to say that she had answered to her knowledge what she could in Parliament and that there was no need to further fret on the matter. When you said answered subsequently, you mean on the 3rd of August itself? Yes, on the 3rd of August. Because you, you're probably referring to a subsequent occasion when MOS Desmond Tan stood up to seek a clarification. That's right. And subsequently, I think Ms Khan herself stood up to make a clarification. That's right. You're referring to those occasions? Yes. Right. Okay, we'll come to the subsequent discussions after 3rd of August later on so that we get the timeline right. I just want to make sure that our lines don't cross. This WhatsApp chat group, could you also produce it to the COP, please? Yeah. At least in relation to the discussions on the 3rd of August speech and any other discussions thereafter that you might have arising from this? Um, I'm not, admittedly, I'm not fully comfortable doing so because it also con it's, it's, a, it's a chat for friends. <laughs> it's not a concern. So there's like anecdotes about my family and all that there too. I understand. Yeah. So to the extent that there are these personal anecdotes on your family, I think we should exclude those. Okay. But I, I'm just asking you to give us the chats and discussions in relation to what happened on the 3rd of August, your discussions on that, and anything else that may have developed from that thereafter. Okay. Okay, thank you. At the Zoom session, what was Mr. Nathan's reaction? I think he was just as shocked as me. What did he say? I can't recall exactly. Can you give us a gist of what he said? Um, I think it was, again, similar to what I said, which is our primary concern was to just console her, um, listen, and that was primarily it. We didn't advise her on any particular course of action. So as of the Zoom discussion on the 7th of August, both of you had known that Mr. Pritam Singh was aware that what Ms. Khan said on the 3rd of August was false. He knew that an untruth had been said, but I think he only knew the full facts after the 7th of August because Ms. Han had shared that she had a meeting with him on, I believe, the 8th of August. Okay, just hold on to that timeline for a moment. I just want to keep to the 7th of August for the time being. <coughs> How did you know, as of you and Mr. Nathan know, as of 7th of August, that Mr. Singh was aware that there were untruths spoken by Ms. Khan on the 3rd of August? Um, I believe, so from what Ms. Han has shared with me, okay, um, in the WhatsApp group, she said, like, before she told the whole thing, she, she said in the WhatsApp group, um, I asked who knows, and she said, only my husband and Mr. Pritam Singh um, not my husband, her husband. Uh, and then she, um, and then on the Zoom call, she said, um, I believe that she told him over the phone that it was not totally true. But I don't think at that point he had the full story, so to speak. When you made the point about who knows, the knows refer to the fact that there was a false statement said in public. No, at that point when she sent that message on WhatsApp, I didn't know what was the thing to know. I see. I, I ran through a list. I was like, did you resign? Did you do this? Did you do that? Yeah. But at some stage before the 7th of August Zoom meeting, you must have known that the fact in question is that there was an untruth said in Parliament. No, no. She didn't refer to that. When she said I did something bad, she didn't refer to I the see. 3rd of August. Yeah. So... It was only said in general terms on the chat. Yeah. And then it was only on the 7th of August Zoom meeting that you and Mr. Nathan knew that the fact in question, the something bad in question relates to 
Yeah, it was only on the Zoom meeting that we realized it was Wait, hang on, let me finish so that, that. So that the class <laughs> Sorry. can... If we speak yeah. over each other, they can't record. Just to repeat the question, it was on the 7th of August that you and Mr. Nathan knew that the something bad refers to the falsehood that she had said in Parliament on the 3rd of August. Yeah. And that was the premise of getting coming together to discuss the matter on Zoom. Yeah. And when she said to you that only Mr. Singh, or at least Mr. Singh and her husband were aware, did she explain when they were aware? Mm, she didn't explain when her husband was aware, but she did explain that she had a phone call with Mr. Singh that afternoon. On the 7th of August? Yes. Did she describe the nature of that phone call? What was discussed? Not in tremendous detail, but just that she had told him that it was not true. Did she tell you or Mr. Nathan at the Zoom call what his reaction was? No. You, you earlier mentioned that... Sorry, I would like to clarify that. Not that I recall. Not that you yeah. recall. So she might have. Yes, yeah, she might have. She might have told you and Mr. Nathan what Mr. Singh's reaction was. Yeah. I, I can't recall exactly. Yeah. But both you and Mr. Nathan were present. So yes. Mr. Nathan might recall. I suppose so, yes. Right. Um, earlier on, when you said your principal focus, and I know you said that in the context of really she's a friend of yours, was on her, her own confidentiality in your words. Yeah. And you said, and when I asked you about the falsehood said in Parliament, you said, well, I knew Mr. Singh was aware. Hmm. I take it that you said that because you were somewhat assuaged that senior party members of the Workers' Party were aware and it is your expectation that the problem will be sorted out at that level. Yes. That's your expectation and would it be fair to say that that's also Mr. Nathan's expectation? Yes. Which is why both of you would have been focused on her welfare rather than what was and turned out to be a serious issue in Parliament? Yes. This expectation that Mr. Singh was aware and therefore senior members of the Workers' Party would be coming in to solve the problem, was that shared by Ms. Khan? Sorry, can you repeat that question again? The expectation that I asked you about, yourself and Mr. Nathan, that Mr. Singh was aware and he would, as a senior party member of the Workers' Party, deal with the problem. To your knowledge, was that also something that Ms. Khan expected or that she shared with you? I guess to some degree, yes. Um, Can you I, I can't testify again to how she truly felt on the matter and all her thoughts on it. But I think on her part, she might have felt that, and this is my assumption, on her part, she might have felt that um, she had done her part to report it to her party leader. Now, you mentioned that her husband was also aware. Yeah. Do you know when he was aware? No. But certainly by the 7th of August, he was aware. According to what she shared with me, yes. Okay. You also mentioned earlier on that subsequent to the discussion on the 7th of August that Ms. Khan had a conversation with Mr. Singh. You said 8th of August earlier. That's right. How did you learn about this? Um, sorry, give me a second. I'm trying to recall. Sure. Um, I can't remember when exactly I learned of it, but I believe it was... I think she might have messaged me on the day itself. Yeah. On the 8th of August? Yeah. Can you describe the gist of that message? She shared that she had informed Mr. Singh, Ms. Sylvia Lim and Mr. Faisal Manap. What did she say that she shared with him? Um, I only have what is on WhatsApp, which is that she discussed the speech, um, told them the truth. Yeah. 
I don't know in exact detail of that conversation. So your understanding is that at the very minimum, she would have told Mr. Pritam Singh, Ms. Sylvia Lim and Mr. Faisal Manap that the anecdote re that she referred to in Parliament was false? Yes. What else did she say in the WhatsApp discussion with you on the 8th of August? I can't recall. Would you also be able to produce this WhatsApp discussion? Um, I would have to check and look at my phone. <laughs> yes, of course. Because that would help us understand what was discussed and also fill in some gaps to the extent that you're not able to recall, which I entirely understand. Sitting yeah. Here. Okay. After the 8th of August, when the three senior party members were aware that there was a falsehood that was said in Parliament on the... 3rd of August, what other steps were taken, to your knowledge? To my knowledge, um, prior to the 4th of October sitting, um, I was not um, privy to what happened in between. Yeah. So, to basically on my part, I didn't know anything, anything until after the 4th of October. To your mind... This would have been a very serious revelation, correct? Of course, yeah. yes. And the expectation is that the senior party members ought to address the problem. Yes. Correct? And so as a party cadre mm -hmm. and as an essay to Ms Khan, who delivered the speech, were you not surprised that we didn't, nothing was heard from the Workers' Party, at least publicly, after the 8th of August? That thought did not cross my mind. But were you not surprised? Surprised that nothing was done? Yes. Um, I, I don't know if surprised would be the right word I would use. Yeah. Well, were you expecting that something would be done? Because you told me earlier that in the hands of the senior party leaders, this is something that you expect them to yeah. work out. So yeah. work out must mean in the context of having said something that is false in parliament mm. to have to fix it, to redress mm. it, correct? Mm. I think on my part, um, I just trusted their judgment, whatever it was. Yeah, like I didn't feel a need to follow up with them personally on it because I felt they know and they should be wise to know what to do with that information. So besides Mr. Pritam Singh, Ms. Silva Lim and Mr. Faisal Manap, who were aware by, at the latest, 8th of August, and I think in Mr. Singh's case earlier, who else in the Workers' Party knew that the anecdote was untrue? Mm, no one else to my knowledge. To your knowledge? Yeah. Well, Mr. Nathan knew. Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, Mr. Nathan, the three MPs, myself. Yeah. Okay. To your knowledge, was there, I mean, you may not have been involved, but you might have heard of it, discuss it with other people or been told about it. Were you aware of any meetings that took place between the party, senior party leaders, any of the activists, volunteers, cadres, in relation to this issue? Not prior to the 4th of October. Okay. Shortly after the speech was delivered on the 3rd of August, we now know what happened in the few days that led up to the 8th of August, so I'm still around that period of time. On the one hand, and this is the context, on the one hand, you were concerned about Ms Khan's welfare because of her own revelation to you as a friend. On the other hand, there is a serious issue in Parliament because it's a matter of serious gravamen. And there's also press speculation about the occasion and why Ms Khan had chosen not to give further details. Mm. Would you have seen those press articles? I'm sure you would have come across them. Yeah, I guess I, I might have read one or two. I don't particularly take note. Yeah, like articles get sent back and forth like all the time. Yeah. Yes, there's so many nowadays. Yes. <laughs> but that would have, in the context of where you were, in the days following 3rd of August, you must have been concerned. On the one hand, Ms Khan has said this. She now has said it's untrue. She's told senior party leaders 
the press is speculating as to why she's not prepared to give more details, you now know that she's in fact unable to give those details and unable to substantiate it, and so does the party leaders. They know that she would have been unable to substantiate any of it because it is not true, it is false. In that context, were you not applying your mind you know, to what next steps would be in this regard? Mm, again, not really, because I, I was just, in my perspective, I'm a friend and also just, you know, a member of the Workers' Party and Parliament is not necessarily a space or arena that I get myself involved in. And I felt that, like, pretty much the two most senior members of the party knew and there was nothing further that I needed to do or worry about. Was I... Worried about Miss Han's personal welfare to some degree, yes, yeah. Yes. But beyond that, um, I didn't. It didn't cross my mind. I yeah. understand. So, I mean, if I can sort of summarize your position, you are saying that because senior party members of the senior party, senior party leaders of the Workers Party were aware, they knew it's untrue. You left it in their hands as to how to deal with it moving forward. Mm, that's correct. You would have expected that they would protect. Both the party position as well as Ms. Khan's position? Um, I, can't, I can't give an answer to that. I, I had zero expectations. <laughs> you had no expectation? As in, I, I just thought, okay, they have the information. Mm, you know, whatever they think is best, I trust them on that matter. So you, you, you trusted that they would do what's best for the party and Ms. Khan? I... I also, th I suppose if you want to list my expectations, I would trust that they would do what's best for the party, Ms. Han, and also for Parliament, being truthful. Yeah. So that was your expectation? Yeah. Okay. Now, post 8th of August, mm. after Ms. Khan told you that she had a discussion with Mr. Pritam Singh, Mr. Faisal Manab, and Ms. Sylvia Lim, and had told them that what she had said in Parliament, the anecdote was false. What other discussions did you have with Ms. Khan thereafter? You mean after 8th of August and before 4th October? Yes. We, I mean, silly things like my family issues. <laughs> sorry, um, no, I, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. Ms. I don't mean to intrude into those and I yeah. don't need you to explain those. I mean, in relation to the issue that we've just been discussing, in relation to the steps issue, to be taken, um, what are the consequences? No, like we didn't have any further discussion on this matter, particularly. Was there any views that you exchanged with Mr. Nathan on this? Mm, no. Did Mr. Nathan, not to, not that I can recall. Yeah. Did Mr. Nathan offer any views to Miss Khan? Not to on my your group chat. Not to my knowledge. But can you look through, and if there are any, could you also produce them to the COP? Yeah, okay. Okay. Can I write that down? Yeah, of course, please do. We will also try and, maybe after we finish with the transcripts, try and make a note of what various requests I've made. Just so I remember, did you say whether or not the trust of what Ms. Khan's discussion with Mr. Singh, Mr. Manap and Ms. Lim were on the group chat? Uh, as I said earlier, to my knowledge, what she had told them, I mean, she had discussed the speech, not just this particular anecdote, but the speech in general, and she had told them the truth about what she had shared. Um, what she exactly conveyed to them, I'm not privy to that conversation. Yeah. Okay. Were there any other form of communication besides WhatsApp? Were there emails? Were there other forms of social media? Not to channels? my knowledge. No telegram or emails? No, not to my knowledge. No. Okay. But perhaps you could have a look and if there are any other such platforms which deal with issues that we have been talking about, yeah, please I will. produce them as well. Okay. Now, let's go to the 4th of October. Okay. The 4th of October, Ms. Khan spoke again in Parliament on this issue. And um, what I thought I'll do is I'll just play an excerpt of the 
exchange because it's just easier to see it visually. Okay. So with Mr. Chairman's permission, may I just show a clip from the proceedings on the 4th of October? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Minister, for the clarifications. Um, like I said, it did happen three years ago, and I haven't been successful getting in touch with the person that I accompanied. Um, and, you know, with regards to confidentiality, I would prefer it for it to remain that way. Thank you. So I asked uh, which police station and uh, which one, and um, the identities of the officers to the extent that Ms. Khan knows them. Ms. Khan, to facilitate the investigation by police to check. Thank you. I do not know the identity of the police officers. Uh, but questions on police station, date, etc. Uh, with regards to confidentiality with the survivor, I would not like to reveal any of this information. Thank you. So we are talking about the police station. That's got nothing to do with the confidentiality of the survivor. Ms. Risaka, uh, Minister is not asking about the identity of the individual. I understand, location. but uh, with regards to confidentiality, I wouldn't like. I will, I will not be revealing the any other information. Thank you. Yes, I have to say that. Perhaps you, the speaker has the power to direct answers since the matter has been raised. And through you, sir, I ask for a direction to be given that we be told which police station in the month, and um, if not the date, at least a month in which police station. Uh, Ms. Khan, I think that's a fair question. Would you like to respond, or are you holding the same position? The reason is that uh, certain Allegations have been made, which I think are fair and uh, serious, and the police, I understand, would like to follow up to check to make sure that uh, they can rectify the situation. So, any leads would be useful without divulging the name of the lady concerned. Thank you. I'd also like to remain, for it to remain confidential. Thank you. Yes. Sir, I don't understand this point about confidentiality. Uh, can I ask through you, sir, for Ms. Khan to confirm in this house, that everything she has told us is accurate, that she did accompany such a person, and such an incident did happen. Ms. Khan? Yes. I think we can stop the clip now. I'll just ask questions yeah. based on this. So, Ms. Lowe, did you see this exchange at the time the exchange took place? No, I did not see it at the time that the exchange took it. place. Um, I learned of this um, on the... Sorry, I wrote it here. I learned of this on the 4th of October through a Yahoo News article. Yeah, I went back to check. Okay, yeah. now let me take it step by step. Prior to the 4th of October, and you would have been aware that there was a parliamentary sitting on the 4th of October... Um, actually, I wasn't aware. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't really following the schedule. You're aware that there is a monthly parliamentary sitting? Yes, I'm aware, yeah. Was there any discussion on what Ms. Khan would say if this issue came up again? Not with me. Not with you. Are you aware if Ms. Khan discussed it with anyone else? Mm. Um, this is information that I have that was shared with me after the 4th of October. Um, I believe she met Mr. Pritam Singh the day before. The day before the 4th of October? That's right. All right. Can you describe the gist of that discussion? Um, okay. Um, she did the, I can't recall if she's the one to tell me this, but definitely I know um, in a subsequent meeting that I had with Mr. Pritam Singh in person at his place that he shared with me, he had met her the day before, and he had told her that he has a feeling this might come up. Um, and I don't know the full details of what he said to her, but he shared with me that he said, I will not judge you. He shared with you and said, I will not judge you, to you? To Miss Raisa Han. To, to Miss Khan. Okay, I'll come to this in a moment, but let's just focus on your knowledge that 
Prior to 4th of October, there was a meeting between Ms. Khan and Mr. Singh. Yes. Okay, let's focus on this because you are saying that there's a subsequent occasion where you had direct knowledge because you were at Mr. Singh's house Correct. discussing the issue. So prior to the 4th of October, Ms. Khan must have told you or sent you a text to inform you that she had discussed it with Mr. Singh. Sorry, prior to what again? Prior to the 4th of October. No, she didn't. No, I'm, what I'm saying is that she, you were aware subsequently that prior to the 4th of October, she had discussed it with Mr. Singh. Yes. So sometime before 4th of October, she and Mr. Singh discussed Yes. what response she should give if this came up in Parliament. Um, I don't know if they discussed what response she should give. Um, I, as I said, it was relayed to me that they had a conversation and that conversation was that he had a feeling that she would be pressed about this issue again and his response to that was that he would not judge Ms. Raisa Han. But you see, in the context of an issue, and let me again give you the circumstances, there was a very serious issue that had been raised post 3rd of August. Yes. We have, we've gone through that. And we are now in a scenario where the leader of the opposition, leader of the Workers' Party, is expecting that this issue will be raised again in Parliament. Yes. And so in the context of any discussion that he must have had, which he had with Ms. Khan, one of the key questions that would arise would be what her response ought to be. Yeah. Correct? I would imagine so, yes. And you would have heard from Ms. Khan that she did have such a discussion with Mr. Singh prior to 4th of October, correct? Yes. Are you aware if Ms. Khan had a discussion with anyone else besides Mr. Singh Not prior to, to my 4th knowledge. of October? Not Any other me. member of parliament? Not to my knowledge. Any activists or volunteers? Not to my knowledge. With Mr. Nathan? No, not to my knowledge. Okay. When you saw this response that she gave in parliament, were you surprised? I don't think I was surprised. Surprised is not the word I would use. Was I scared for her? Yes. And you must have been scared because this is completely at odds with what you know the truth to be. Correct. And you would have expected that there ought to have been a proper resolution of this by coming clean and admitting that it was wrong and false. Mm, maybe I can give my, my full thoughts on the maybe matter. Maybe you can answer my question and then you can elaborate. I'm just asking what your expectation would have been. Yeah, I'm, I can't answer that because um, it didn't occur to me like, Ms. Han and Mr. Singh had a feeling, I mean, they had that conversation that she might be pressed, but I didn't. So I had, no, I, I thought it was done. Like, I didn't think that it would come up again. No, so, I, I yeah. understand. I, I'm just asking you, because, see, you're telling us that you didn't know that there was going to be a discourse in Parliament, right? On Correct, this. yeah. And you saw it secondhand, as it were, later in the day. Yeah. But having seen it, knowing what you knew, and being involved in discussions with Ms. Khan, with Mr. Nathan, knowing that she has disclosed this to senior party leaders, Mr. Faisal Manap, Mr. Pritam Singh and Ms. Silvia Lim, and knowing the truth of the matter and knowing that the anecdote could not be substantiated, my question is, were you not, perhaps not surprised since you may not like that word, but were you not at least taken aback that that position on several occasions, quite strident and quite confident that everything that she had said happened, happened. Were you not taken aback? Um, I suppose I was shocked, um, but my primary feeling was worry and fear, yeah. And you, worry, you worried and feared because you knew or you appreciated the gravity of the situation? Correct to have lied once in Parliament and then repeated the lie again Correct. two months later. Correct. Correct? Yeah. And your expectation is that, perhaps it's not, let me rephrase this, your advice to Ms Khan would have been to own up to this and deal with the issue and not perpetuate the falsehood, correct? Yes, and actually, when I read the news, I had told her my personal advice to her was to tell the CEC. 
tell the CEC the truth. Yes. And that she should go to Parliament to tell the truth. Um, I didn't go that far. La. <laughs> but that must be the natural consequence yeah. of I that. mean, telling the CEC would necessitate that the information would come to public knowledge. Yeah. Yes, and in fact, she did tell the key members of the CEC, Mr. Singh, Ms. Ma Ms. Lim and Mr. Manap. Uh, yes, but my message was to tell the whole CEC. Well, what you do know is that at least those three were aware. Correct. Whether there were anyone else on the CEC who was aware, you're not so sure. Yeah. Right. You mentioned that sometime subsequent to the 4th of October, you then met with Mr. Pritam Singh at his house. Correct. What date was this? 12th of October. Can you describe how this meeting came to be set up? I had reached out to him. How did you reach out to him? On WhatsApp. Can you tell us the gist of that discussion on WhatsApp? Um, I just said, Hi Pritam, um... I said, Yudish and I would like to meet you to discuss basically what had transpired. And what was his response? He said, okay. And was... gave me his address. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And uh, can you tell us whether prior to the meeting, yourself and Yudish had any prior discussion? You must have had for you to agree to go to a meeting together, right? Yeah, so... On the uh, Earlier on the 12th of October, I believe Miss Han phoned me. And I mean, if I recall correctly, I can't... I mean, a lot of things has happened then. So she phoned me to share with me that I think she was... There was a decision for her to make the statement, to clarify with Parliament. And my request to meet with Mr. Pritam Singh was to confirm um, how it should take place. Yeah. When you saw the statement that she gave mm -hmm. in Parliament on the 4th of October and knowing what you knew at that point in time, were you not surprised that Mr. Singh would sit in Parliament along with Ms. Ma Ms. Lim and Mr. Manap and allow Ms. Khan to perpetuate and repeat the lies several times? I was... Maybe I can again give a fuller explanation of my thoughts. At that moment, my primary concern was fear and worry for both Ms. Han and the party. Um, it was only much later when I had more time to think about it that I felt that he should have spoken up. And why do you think he should have spoken up? Because he's the leader of the opposition and of the Workers' Party. And it's the right thing to do. When you saw the exchange on the 4th of October, does it not suggest to you that, because you, you subsequently knew that there was a prior discussion between Ms. Khan and Mr. Singh, you would have thought that this was the agreed position between Ms. Khan and Mr. Singh, correct? I, I'm not sure how to answer that because, as I said, I didn't even know the sitting was happening and I didn't know she would be pressed again. <clears throat> and I didn't know that they had a conversation prior. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's fair enough because you knew this only later. Correct. But now that you know what you know, you know mm -hmm. would it not be a fair assumption that the meeting prior to 4th of October between Mr. Singh and Ms. Khan was to settle the terms of what she would say if she's pressed? Yeah, I would imagine. Which he had expected would happen. Yeah, I would imagine that they should have discussed the best way to handle it. And so, were you taken aback or surprised that this was the agreed position with the party leader in Parliament? But I mean, I knew it wasn't the agreed position to take because Mr. Singh had left the choice up to her with these words of, I will not judge you. But certainly Mr. Singh, by that time, knew what the true position was. And he was present in Parliament when those falsehoods continued to be perpetrated, correct? Correct. As a senior party member and a cadre member, were you not surprised? I was not surprised, but I was disappointed. What do you think Ms. Khan's role in that was? Because as I explained at the start, we, what we need to do as a COP is to assess her culpability, relative culpability. And one of the important points for us to consider 
is the extent to which she made her own decisions mm. or she had sought the counsel or advice of senior party leaders. So in that context, do you think this is something that Ms. Khan went along with, was told to do, or decided on her own volition to continue to lie in Parliament? I, I, can't, I can't really give an answer to that. I, I really don't know. I'm asking you to make a judgment based on the fact that not just are you Ms. Khan's essay, but a friend, someone who knows her reasonably well. Okay. Um, and with whom she obviously confides in because yeah. you and Mr. Nathan, besides her family, will be the only ones she confided with in. Yeah. I think given that Ms. Han and Mr. Singh's experience with politics is very different, considering Mr. Singh is more seasoned, um, that she would have relied on him to some extent for clarity and direction. And that because he said, I will not judge you, might have given her the false sense that it was all right to not come clean. Yeah. This phrase, I might not judge you, I will not judge you, was intended to convey a sense of assurance to Miss Khan, right? I don't know like how it was said. Yeah. So I, but I hmm. I'm asking you from the perspective of you having heard from Miss Khan who reported the conversation to you. Actually it was Mr. Singh who shared with me the who conversation. With you. What was your takeaway since you heard directly from him? I suppose he was implying that he gave her the choice. Yeah, and that she had then acted independently thereafter. That's what he's, he's implying. Yeah. But your expectation is that as a senior party leader, as you said, he is more seasoned and would be expected to guide her in that process, correct? Correct. So on the 12th of October, coming back to this meeting, you and your, Yudish and yourself had arranged to meet with Mr. Singh. Correct. Was Ms. Khan present? No. What time was this meeting? It was late at night, I think around 8 or 9 p.m. Can you, as far as you can recall, recount the meeting to us? What happened? Who said what? And what was discussed? Uh, it was a fairly long meeting, so I won't be able to recall everything, but I can give you the of gist. Course. Please do. The gist was to discuss if um, what would happen after she informs Parliament of the truth, meaning how she should say the truth and procedurally what I would be involved in and what Mr. Nada would be involved in thereafter, such as, for me on my part, maintaining open, open communications with residents and volunteers about the matter because we knew that everyone would be shocked. And on Mr. Nadan's part to um, to help maintain any social media sort of um, messages and things like that, because we know she would receive a lot of messages thereafter. Mm -hmm. So he was brought in to, you know, help manage that. I suppose. Yeah. Did you discuss how you would come put across the points in Parliament to clarify her position? Yeah, there was a there was a discussion of how she should tell the truth and to what extent of personal information she should reveal. So definitely the consensus was that she should tell the truth, but that she had lied. But we were we we were not sure if she should share that personal anecdote of her being a sexual assault survivor herself. At any point in this meeting, did, did the meeting discuss why she could not or should not have told the truth earlier? I mean, after all, this is barely a week after the last sitting. So you mean why she didn't say the truth when pressed on the 4th of October? 4th of October. No, we didn't discuss that. You didn't discuss that because you you and Mr. Nathan, I presume, had assumed that this was something that was discussed between Mr. Singh and Ms. Khan. No, I think we didn't discuss it because it was just like water under the bridge, like happened already. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I guess I can understand that. What else was discussed at this meeting? For instance, did you have some points? Was there a draft? No, no, no. There was no draft. Did you take notes as to what was discussed and how No, to we didn't together? take notes. It was just a discussion of, you know, 
I, I mean, let me give a bit more context as well. When I went to the meeting, my primary concern as her friend was to make sure that her mental well-being was protected. And understandably, everything that has transpired is a very stressful um, event for Ms. Han. And given that she was a victim of sexual assault as well, I was worried <clears throat> that a revelation like this to the public would be very hard for her to bear. And I had gone to that meeting with you know, the intention of working things in a way that she could be protected as much as possible. Mm -hmm. At the meeting, can you give me a gist of what Mr. Singh said, his approach, his thinking, and what he told her to do or what his advice he gave her or, and to yourself and Mr. Nathan? Yeah, his advice to give to her was that she needed to tell the truth and... Um, I mean, he was very sure of that. Lah. But he wasn't sure if also if she should review um, the circumstances of her sexual assault. Um, and then, I mean, I mean it, re it revolved largely around that. Um, yeah, I can't recall exactly like the specifics of our conversation. After this meeting, did you share your thoughts on what have transpired at the meeting with Ms. Khan? Sorry, I'm trying to recall. Um, I think briefly, yeah, briefly. It, it must have been so because you are here discussing, again in context, it is now two and a half months since she first mm. gave a false anecdote in Parliament. Since then, she has faced several questions from the media. Mm. There's been a further questioning in Parliament, a very direct one, as you can see earlier. Yeah. And thereafter, in the aftermath of October, the 4th October sitting, there were even more focus on why she could not come with details. Mm -hmm. Now, on the 12th of October, you are discussing a cause which is diametrically opposite to everything that she had done previously. Right. She is not present at the meeting. Yeah. So it would have been natural for you or Mr. Nathan or both to have discussed these details with, you, with her. Because how would you know that she would now do this? Yeah, I, I can't remember how we discussed it with her, but I think we informed her in some way or another that, um, that we are here to help her, basically, me and Mr. Nathan. But you must have narrated to her what transpired, what not, it was agreed not to Not everything. To do. Yeah. So what, what did you tell her? I, I told her that, um, yeah, it was right thing, like it's the right thing to do. I think, mm, maybe let me just rewind a little bit. I think when she called me on the 12th of October to tell me that she was going to tell Parliament of the truth, there was a degree of worry on her part of how, obviously, you know, how it would affect her thereafter, which is why I went to seek Mr. Singh's um, confirmation of how it would take place so that things can be put in place to ensure her mental well-being, um, as in, because it would be really bad. So, you know, to make sure that at least she was not so bad, you know, after. Um, uh, so I, when, after we had the discussion with Mr. Singh, I believe we conveyed to her that, you know, okay, it's the right thing to do and we will support you in this endeavour. Yeah. Um, and that support, as I mentioned, refers specifically to me, um, you know, ensuring that communications remained open with volunteers and uh, volunteers and residents and on Mr. S uh, on Mr. Nathan's part to ensure that, you know, there was someone looking after her social media accounts after that. Okay, I understand this. So, would you say that after the 12th of October, there was a consensus that she would now make a clarification in Parliament? Correct. Did you start to put together the terms of what she would say, discuss it with her? Um, Ms. Han drafted her own statement, but uh, Mr. Nathan and I did sort of 
you know, help to review it and assist it in, again, polishing grammar, clarity, yeah. Are you aware if anyone else gave Ms. Khan comments on the draft? Yes, I am aware. Can you tell us who gave comments to her? Um, there were many, there were not many, but there were a few versions of this draft before the final statement. Um, and I believe Mr. Singh, Ms. Sylvia Lim, not sure about Mr. Faisal Manap, but definitely Ms. Sylvia Lim and Mr. Singh had given her comments. What about the two MPs who moved the motion, Ms. Her and Mr. Pereira? They were not, <clears throat> they were not aware of what's going on at this point. To your knowledge? To my knowledge. What was some of the input given by Mr. Singh, Ms. Lim and perhaps Mr. Manap? Can you give us a gist? I can't recall exactly. Um, I was only present for their comments on one part of the, like, one occasion of the draft. And... Um, I think there was a discussion of, you know, how much personal information she should review. Yeah. Or, uh, like, the details of her sexual assault. Mm. Yeah. Let me, let me tell you where I'm coming from on this mm. so that you can understand the, the angle I'm taking. I'd like to understand the evolution of this draft, beginning from the 12th of October, your discussions, which were obviously, according to your evidence so far, which I understand, was the genesis of what eventually transpired in Parliament on the 1st of November. So there's roughly a two, two and a half week window. So I'm trying to understand the evolution of the draft. And you said that there were a few versions of the draft mm. being exchanged, several people giving comments to it. So I'd like, as far as possible, for you to track for me the evolution. What was initially agreed? What was added in or removed? How it, what were the discussions on this? And how eventually it became the version that we saw on the 1st of November? Okay. Um, admittedly, I cannot remember everything. Um, and I don't know what was removed or added. But I think it was really <clears throat> um, almost kind of like rearranging paragraphs of like what should come first and things like that. So I don't recall on my part there was like major subtractions. It was sort of redacting, not redacting, sorry, that's the wrong word. Removing parts where, for example, she would describe why she mm -hmm. did not um, report her own sexual assault when she was younger. Yeah, so we removed a lot of, you know, sort of, the personal reasons for why she lied um, in, in terms of her logic and explanation. Um, and we, you know, uh, our edits were primarily for legibility, clarity, and again, like, you know, ensuring that there was a message to, thank you, um, tell the lie, I mean, come clean with the lie as truthfully as possible and with as much clarity as possible, I guess, yeah. Was there a discussion on the reasons why she told the lie? Um, the reason was always the one that she shared, which is, you know, she didn't want to reveal that she was part of the support group. Yeah. Let me um, ask for the club to play the, tran the tran uh, excerpt of the proceedings on the 1st of November, and then I'll ask you some questions about okay. that statement. Could the clerk assist me, please? for that, maybe I'll just ask, in terms of what was the form in which these exchanges were taking place? Was it WhatsApp? Was it through email? For the drafts specifically, it was in person. <clears throat> Meaning um, hard copy and so yeah. on and so on. They were printed copies and... And you would have some of these copies still available? No, I don't have any of them. That's why I'm making this apology today. Yes, I understand. Um, Can you, uh, sorry... I, I'd like to uh, start with Ms. Khan's statement. I think she made a brief statement before she was asked some questions by Lida. 
On the 3rd of August, I spoke in this house on the motion on empowering women. During my speech, I had shared an anecdote of a survivor of sexual assault. I was not present with the survivor in the police station as I described. The anecdote was shared by the survivor in a women's support group for women, which I was a part of. I did not share that I'm part of the group as I did not have the courage to publicly admit that I was part of it. I attended this support group because I myself am a survivor of sexual assault. I was sexually assaulted when I was 18 studying abroad. That assault has traumatized me till this day. The fear and shame accompanying sexual assault is extreme and long-lasting, as it has been and still is for me. Unlike the survivor whose anecdote I shared in this house, I did not have the courage to report my own assault. Yet, as a survivor, I wanted so deeply to speak up and also share the account I had heard when speaking on the motion without revealing my own private experience. I should not have shared the survivor's anecdote without her consent, nor should I have said that I accompanied her to the police station when I had not. It was wrong of me to do so. To survivors of sexual violence, I hope that this does not deter you from reporting your assaults. In sharing an anecdote without consent, I disregarded the principle of consent in discussions around survivors, consent, and sexual assault. As a survivor myself, I feel this failure deeply. It is important for me to take responsibility for my actions, for my error of judgment, and to set the record straight. I wish to correct the record by retracting the anecdote that I shared on the 3rd of August, and I wish to apologize to the Singapore Police Force. Okay, we can stop there. There are several other exchanges, and I thought I'd rather than play it here and take time, I will get a hard copy to you so that you have a reference point in case you can't remember what was exchanged between herself and the leader. So could the club please give to Ms. Lo copies of the extracts from the 1st of November? While waiting for that, Ms. Lo, I assume that this would have been one occasion where you watched this live? Um, hilariously, actually, I didn't because um, something happened in the office and I needed to rush to office. Okay. But you would have watched it sometime shortly after, I assume. I managed to rush home in time to only watch the part where um, Ms. Indrani Raja questioned her. I see. So not the initial statement, but the subsequent exchange. <laughs> yeah. Which you now have before you. So... You would have seen it, just, just this is about a month ago, but I put the record here so that you can refresh yourself. Now, if you follow a few lines from where we stopped the video, uh, you will see that the exchange between Ms. Ms. Khan and the leader, she confirmed that she had in fact not gone down to the police station, and that's not true, right? Yeah. And the part about accompanying the police, the survivor to the police station and what the member allegedly saw was also untrue, right? Yeah. And further down, Ms. Khan accepted that the statement that the pers person that I had accompanied, which was her response later in the day on the 3rd of August, was also untrue, correct? Yeah. And finally, if you look further down the page at page 3, Ms. Khan confirmed that everything she, when she was asked by Minister Shanmugam that everything she had told us is accurate, she did accompany such a person and such an incident did happen, and her answer of yes at, on that occasion was untrue, right? Yeah. Now, would you accept that I can show you the relevant portion of the rest of the transcript, but would you accept that there would have been no need to refer 
to the question of the support, her own attendance at a support group, to make the point that she wanted to. Yes, I suppose there was no need to. Ms Khan herself accepted that in the course of further discourse between herself and the leader, right? Sorry, let me read it a bit. Sure. Let me refer you to page 4. And if you look at page 4, you see somewhere around the first one third, Ms Raja says, I do completely empathise with the reason. All I'm asking is this, and I'm not sure I had a response. My question was simply, it would have been possible to tell the story without the untruths and without referring to the survivors group. Would the member agree? Ms Khan says, sorry. Uh, so if I was unclear, I apologise. Yes, I do feel it would have been possible. So she accepts that it's possible to make the speech, make the same points, but without going into the support group. Mm -hmm. Further down the page, you, in fact, over the next page, at page 5, Ms. Lo, you will see in the middle, Ms. Khan says, one of the principles of being in a women's support group is that the details should remain confidential. Mm. You see that? Yeah. Ms. Raja then goes on to say, few lines down from there, that she did not want to disclose because of confidentiality, but based on what the member has just said, actually, by that time, because the story had already been recounted, it means the member had already breached the confidentiality to the survivor. Is that not correct? Ms Khan's answer, that is correct, yes. So, confidentiality is also not a reason for having put up the false anecdote. Would you agree? Meaning, if you follow the exchange between Ms Khan and Ms Raja, the fact of the matter is at the moment you describe, and she described it as a 25-year-old three years ago and so on, the moment you describe that occasion, that's a breach of the confidentiality already, which yeah. Ms Khan accepted, right? Mm. So actually, confidentiality was not a reason for having given the false anecdote. Would you accept? Uh, I think there are varying degrees of confidentiality. Sorry, it's a long word. Um, and I think um, while now we understand that what that means is you know, not, you know, including not revealing you know, details of what was shared in that support group. I suppose without providing personal information, just saying that, you know, this happened, somebody went to a police station, this happened, was like, but you know, you know, all right, I guess, I don't know. But I think, you see, Miss Khan accepted it, and I think it is fairly common as a standard when it comes to mutual support groups in particular, that even mentioning this would be a breach of the confidentiality, and I think Miss Khan agreed with that. So, on mm. that basis that Ms. Khan had agreed with that, would you not agree that actually confidentiality was no excuse, not a reason for giving the false anecdote? Uh, it stands I, to reason, right? I, I, I don't know how to respond to this question. If I, if I come and say that, well, because of confidentiality, I had to lie, mm. when in fact, you had already breached the confidentiality, there would be well, it would be a it would be a circular argument, right? Yeah, I think there's a slight separation here. Prior to, you know, uh, knowing that she had lied, confidentiality of protecting the victim to me is a good reason. <laughs> to yes, me, yeah. To you, but yeah, I'm asking but, you to look yeah, at it from the perspective but of there this time. Thereafter, I don't think it was Miss Raisa Han's intention to say that she had lied because of confidential reasons. Um, she had lied to keep her identity as a sexual assault victim private. Yes, but as you as we agreed on that earlier, that fact need not have been disclosed. It could have remained private and still Miss Khan could have made the same points. A yeah. point that she had agreed to herself. Yeah. Right? So where I'm coming from, Miss Lowe, is that in fact if you look at what we've seen on the screen earlier mm. The additional reasons which explain or seek to explain away 
mm. why she gave the false anecdote. They don't hold water, right? Um, I personally disagree. Um, my perspective, and this was something we also, I, I mean, I shared with her personally at some point, that it was important that in her statement, she made known her personal anecdote to some small degree because um, it is a thing that people often disbelieve sexual assault survivors and without sharing that experience, her lie would seem really, really bad, for lack of a better word. And the repercussions is not so much on her, but on other sexual assault victims. Yes, and which is why in this case, instead of sharing her own story to make the speech in Parliament more believable, she made up a story about accompanying a victim. Mm. And the purpose of doing that was to lend believability and credibility to the account, right? Uh, I mean, I, I can't answer that for why she lied. Like, I mean, don't, she has her own reasons. You know? I mean, looking at it with your own lens, that would have been, the, objectively, that would have been the reason for giving that account. That would have been a consequence. Yeah, I don't know if it was a reason. All right. Okay. So you accept that the consequence of someone listening to a speech, reading a speech with a personal anecdote, yeah. which in this case was a false one, yeah. would get the impression that this is a more credible story. Correct. Right. Yes, I agree to that. Now, earlier on, Mr. Chairman asked if the drafts were exchanged in copies which you still have. Do you still have them? No, I don't have any of them. Who would have them? Miss Han. Miss Khan would have them. Yeah. She would have kept the various versions uh, exchanged. I'm not sure comments. if she kept it. Yeah. Were any of these drafts circulated by email? No, WhatsApp? Not, to, not, not to my knowledge. Yeah. At least not to you. Yeah, not but to it me. may have been to other people. Yeah, maybe. So just to be clear, can you tell me who was involved in, in reviewing the draft? Besides Mr. Singh, Ms. Lim, yourself, Ms. Khan, was Mr. Nathan involved? Yeah, Mr. Nathan was involved. Who else was involved? Not to my knowledge. Yeah. Were any of the other senior members of WP involved? No. Uh, no. I mean... Not to your knowledge. Not, not to my knowledge. But sometime when... She, I guess there was a... I mean, I wasn't part of this conversation, but I assume at some point there was a informing of party leaders like the CEC, and then the statement was made. So you would expect that this statement, whilst principally drafted and commented upon by a few people, would get the clearance and buy-in of the, of the CEC? Uh, I'm not sure about that. You're not sure? Yeah. Is that what you expected? Mm, I don't expect that, yeah. I think they would have been informed that she would be coming clean, but I don't, I, I can't, I don't know if, you know, they saw a copy of the so statement. So they would know what she would be planning to do to yeah. come clean, but may not know the specific details of what would be in the statement. Correct. But you do know that Mr. Singh and Ms. Lim were aware and were giving comments and were part of the drafting process. Yeah, they were part of the drafting process. Uh, They were giving comments, now. yeah. But I don't think they like actually typed in the words. That's all Miss Han. Okay, all right. Yeah. But, you know, you can shape and put a direction to it even without yeah. having to type in the words, right? Yeah, so I wouldn't use the term drafting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Influencing. Yeah. Okay. Now, in this period of time, and I'm still at the 12th of October. Okay. There's about two and a half weeks before the 1st of November, which is when we saw the speech. Yeah. What was the discussion that you had with Ms. Khan? Mm, predominantly just about the statement. Okay. Yeah. And, I mean, just about her MPS, that's all. Yeah. Were there any interactions that you had with anyone else from the WP? Oh, uh, no. On this issue? No? No. Not at all? Mm. Would you be able to check your phone for messages to see if there are any other communications that you might have had? Mm, yeah, I will. Yeah, but I'm I'm quite sure on that. Yeah, because it was obviously very serious, <laughs> and we wanted to, you know, okay, keep it contained. Okay, yeah. so those occasions where you exchanged a draft earlier, you told Speaker, uh, Mr. Chairman, that there's it was in hard copy. 
And you also told me that on the 12th of October, there were no drafts yet. Yeah. So obviously, sometime between 12th October and 1st November, you must have met together again to discuss the drafts. Mm. Right? Since you said it's not on email. Yeah. So can you describe that to me, please? When did you meet? Who did you meet? What dates? How many times? What was discussed? Okay. Uh, I can't... I didn't write this down for some reason. I can't, rem- I can't remember exactly when we met, but I was part of one meeting at the Workers' Party headquarters um, and people present were who I might really shared. Yeah. Um, Just for the record, it's Mr. Singh, Ms. Lim? Mr. Singh, Ms. Lim, Ms. Nadan, myself, Ms. Han. Okay. What date would this meeting be? I can't remember. But sometime in the intervening period between 12th October and 1st November? Yeah. Okay. There would have been WhatsApp discussions to set up the meeting, right? To explain that there was a draft that was done. Yeah. I was informed by Mr. Singh. Yeah. Okay, so you have a chat with him as well? Yes. Would you be able to produce that? Yeah. To the extent part, relevant yeah. to any of the issues concerning the COP? Anything arising from or related to the speech that was made in Parliament on the third We August? didn't discuss um, on text. Yeah, the details. Yeah. Well, to the extent that you find anything, can you please okay. give us a copy? This, besides this meeting, were there any other meetings? Not to my knowledge. So you had one meeting to discuss the drafts? Yeah. And it was at that meeting that views were exchanged? Yeah. Were they exchanged verbally or did someone mark up the drafts? How verbally. Was that verbally? Yeah. Can yeah. you... I, I know it's about six weeks ago, but can you try to recall... Actually, it's less than six weeks ago. It was about maybe four, a month ago. Mm. Can you try and recall who said what at that meeting? Um, I think in that meeting there was a discussion um, uh, I think Miss Han had showed her family um, a version of the draft and I think they were very concerned so there was a lot of discussion on her family that day, yeah. Can you because give us the gist of that concern and the discussion? Yeah, because I guess um, even at the, to my knowledge, like, even at the 12th of October, her parents did not know of the truth and of her own sexual assault. So it was like a lot of, a lot of things to take in for them, like, yeah. So her parents were very upset. On, on various reasons, the fact that she lied, the fact that she was sexual assaulted, and the fact that she lied, uh, and then, you know, that she was going to have to tell everything to Parliament. So they were very, very concerned, and a lot of the discussions was how can we word her statement to ensure her parents were respected um, and to allay their concerns, yeah. Were, was her family aware of what had been discussed on the 12th of October and the eventual position taken by by Ms. Khan and Mr. Singh? Aware of? Aware of what would she plans to do at the next sitting of Parliament. Uh, I don't know when they were made aware exactly. I can't recall. Um, but they, they knew, definitely before she made the statement, she, they knew lah. Yeah, so that meeting was to, you know, kind of go over uh, their concerns, I suppose, yeah. Their concerns related to, were they drafting issues or were, was it a question of whether this should have been done at all in broad direction or is it what kind of points to be raised? I think what kinds of points should be raised, yeah. I can't recall. <clears throat> your sense is that the family would have been uh, agreeable to her coming clean in Parliament to speak the truth? Um, I, I don't know exactly what was exchanged between her and her family members, but I think uh, what, what I understood was that her family was very worried on, again, also like her well-being. La. Of course. Yeah. Are you aware if her family met with or spoke to or communicated with any members of the Workers' Party? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Now, 
we were in a process of going through what was discussed at the meeting mm. on, the 12th, on the I forgot if you gave me a date. You said a few days after the 12th of October, right? Uh I don't know if it was a few days. I can't rem- I I genuinely cannot remember. Yeah, at the workers party HQ. Yeah. And we were going through what was the individual responses by each person. So you said that the concerns of the family members took quite a bit of time. Yeah. Besides this, <coughs> were there any other comments that you can remember? Um, as I said, the concerns were, the conversation was primarily around her family's concerns, to what degree of you know how much she should explain why she lied. You know, like as I said, like um, her, why she didn't report her own sexual assault. Mm-hmm. You know, and did, yeah. Did anyone else in the workers' party who was present, Mister Singh, Miss? Uh, Miss Lim or Mr. Nathan talk about the two reasons that she gave on confidentiality and also on the mutual support group. The very two reasons that she agreed with Ms. Ms. Raja subsequently were not factors which would have mattered. Mm. I, I showed you them, I showed you those passages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. I'm just thinking if they did... Um I don't think they mentioned specifically confidentiality. Um, uh, I think, yeah, I, I, I can't recall if they did. Um, you see, to, to just <coughs> assist you a little bit, yeah. confidentiality could not have been a new point at that point in time because it was, in fact, the core of Ms. Khan's answers on the I 4th understand. of October. Yeah. So confidentiality could not have been a new reason. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, it was used as a reason for not going into further details on the 4th of October, mm. which, if you remember, Ms. Lo was a, uh, took place after... Ms. Khan and Mr. Singh mm. had a discussion on the parliamentary sitting and the expectation that this issue would come up. Right. right? So that's the context. And therefore, I'm assuming for the time being that Mr. Singh, Ms. Khan knew that confidentiality would be used as one reason or one excuse on the 4th of October for not disclosing further details. And that seemed mm-hmm. to have carried through to the 1st of November meeting. 1st of November speech, rather. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to ask you if you can remember any discussions along this vein. So, okay, you're asking if Mr. Singh or any other party members or leaders had requested that the confidentiality reason be addressed in her statement? Is that what you're asking? Well, not so much address anything about it. Uh, I, I don't... I mean, I can't recall. Uh, I don't think so, yeah. Okay. Okay. Perhaps if we looked at the drafts that had been revised over time, the evolution of the drafts, I mean, which you say Ms. Khan has, perhaps that would shed some light. Yeah. But that after that meeting, it had evolved a bit more and I was not part of those. Uh, like, when I saw her speech, I was, I mean, it was like new to me. Yeah. Like, as in, it didn't change severely, but, you know, I was like, oh, okay, this is the final version. So the, there are parts of it which had been changed subsequent to your involvement. Yeah. And which you saw only for the first time on yeah. on the 1st of November. Yeah. Okay. Now, at any point in time between the 12th of October, when you decided or you had a meeting with Mr. Singh to uh, come clean to mm. h- and how to deal with it, and if you remember, you said that prior to that meeting, there was a call, uh, that you, the discussion that you had with Ms. Khan mm. about her coming to Parliament to mm. come clean. At any point in time between that and the 1st of November, was there any discussion, to your knowledge, about what the Workers' Party would do consequent upon her giving this statement on the 1st of November? What the Workers' Party would do, as in like put out a statement? or not a statement, set up a disciplinary inquiry? No. Nothing whatsoever? No. In fact, what were the words you said Mr. Singh said to you about Ms. Khan? 
on the fourth of like after the. No, you you mentioned uh, that Mr. Singh told you that he will not judge Ms. Khan. Yeah, that was on the twelfth of October. Yes. Yeah. So. That I think we earlier agreed. You took as a sign that that was reassuring. Right. He's prepared to let her do as she thinks appropriate. I mean, I will assume he's prepared. Uh, if he <laughs> if he said that to her, um, meaning, I mean, you say that with the knowledge that it could go either way, right? <laughs> yes, but yeah. he's also saying that with the knowledge that as early as a few days after this, the statement was made, he was aware that it was false. Uh, like after the 1st of November statement? No, after the 3rd of August speech. Yes, yeah. He knew it was false you when see, he said that. The context is this. You, you make a, there's a speech that was made in Parliament. Uh -huh. It is a, to speak a falsehood anywhere is serious, but in Parliament it is all the more so. Mm -hmm. The leader of the party is aware shortly after the 3rd of August that it was false. Mm. He sat by and discussed it with her in expectation that two months later this issue will come up again. And he was in Parliament when she reiterated the falsehoods several times, including a very strident answer that we saw the video of earlier. And then there was a meeting to say, let's come clean. But he says to her through you that he will not judge her. In the context of this... He didn't say that to her through me. He okay. said it to her directly um, in a meeting that the two of them had. But then later on the 12th he, of October, he, he relayed recounted that. He recounted it okay. to me. Yeah. I understand. Thank you for that clarification. And in that context, nothing was said about what sanctions would take place and so on. No. So this is the context that I have mm. sketched out. Yeah. My question is, in that context, did it surprise you when Workers' Party decided to set up a disciplinary inquiry? Yes, it surprised me. I'd like you to look at the two statements issued by the Workers' Party on the 1st and on the 2nd of November. Mm. And I'll hand you a copy. Okay. Could, could the clerks please assist me? The first and second November statements of statements of the Workers' Party. One is titled the Secretary General's statement. Mm. The other is titled the Worker Workers' Party media statement. First and second November, respectively. So, Ms. Lo, let me just take you through the two statements briefly. On the 1st of November, this is shortly after we, we saw the clip in Parliament earlier, we shortly after the parliamentary sitting. The Secretary General released a statement which says, MP Reisha Khan should not have shared an account that contained untruths in the House. Mm. Let me just pause for a moment. Did you read this statement when it was issued? Yeah, I mean, I only read it after it was issued. I was not privy that a statement would be coming up. Did the first line strike you as odd, given that, in fact, the Secretary General was present in Parliament when she not just shared the untruth, but continued to perpetrate it on the 4th of October? Mm, I wouldn't say that it struck me as odd. What was your reaction? You, you think this is usual? Um... My honest opinion is, and this is my personal opinion, is that I was, you know, not surprised that a statement had been made because I think he felt obliged um, and it was kind of made sense that after a big revelation that the Secretary General put out a statement. But I was, I suppose, um, not fully happy 
with the contents of this statement because it did not reveal his knowledge of the matter. Absolutely. Yeah. This seeks to draw a line and a divide between what he knew, what the Workers' Party knew, and what Ms. Khan did. Mm. Correct? Yeah, it was, and this is my personal opinion, that the intention of this statement was to make it seem that way. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. It goes on to say that the PPIA gives an MP significant freedom of speech to the extent that what is said in Parliament cannot be impeached or questioned outside Parliament. This freedom of speech does not extend to communicating untruthful accounts, even if an MP's motives are not malicious. Again, bearing in mind the context that I've raised earlier, and bearing in mind what happened on the 4th of October, given that there was a discussion between Ms. Khan and Mr. Singh prior to 4th of October, which centred around his expectation that this issue would be raised, and therefore what she should say in response, does this sentence strike you as odd, surprising? The sentence MP Rai Sahan should not have shared an account? Yes. Does it also strike you as one which seeks to divide the line between what he, as the Secretary General, knew, and the Workers' Party knew, and what Ms. Khan did? Mm. I, I don't know if it's sought to divide, but... Um It's my feeling was that it seemed to want to separate matters, la. Yeah. Yes, se separate matters. Matters meaning meaning, separate meaning between the Workers Party and the Secretary General on one hand and Miss Khan on the other. Um, yeah, I suppose. That's what you meant, right? Yeah. It goes on to say for victims, uh, Risa has apologized to the SPF victims of sexual assault, her constituents, WP members, volunteers, parents. She shared with me that she wanted to set the record straight in Parliament. Again, just pausing for a moment, this will probably make reference to the various discussions that Ms Khan had with Mr Singh, presumably culminating on the period around the 12th of October, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, or correct. there might be others to your Yeah, knowledge. I mean, I, they might have conversations between the 4th of October and the 12th of October, but I don't know the details of those discussions, I if they had any. And it goes on to say this was the correct thing to do. Yeah. This suggests that prior to this statement being made and the apology being tendered on the 1st of November, he had no knowledge of this. Uh, I don't know. All right. But overall, would you accept that ob objectively? I, I, I know I'm, I'm not asking to you to read into other people's state of mind or intentions, but objectively. I mean, you're a editor. Yeah. You edit content. <laughs> yes. You obviously have a good experience in that, on that, having majored in history as well. Yes. Objectively, this statement conveys the impression that the Secretary General and the Workers' Party in general were not aware of the falsehoods spoken by Ms. Khan in Parliament prior to the 1st of November, right? Um, again, I, I cannot, because, you know, many people read this and everyone will have different opinions of this. Um, I'm to, just asking for a reaction. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, to, to me, there is, given that I, I, I knew what happened when I read this, it felt that the omission of their involvement was in, intentional. Yes, and that's quite stuck by its omission, right? Yeah. Given all that you know that has happened. Correct. Which includes Mr. Singh, Mr. Manap and Ms. Lim's knowledge of the falsehood from a few days after the 3rd of August. Yeah. Correct? Mm. Now, can you go to the next statement on the 2nd of November? And this time round is a Workers' Party media statement. Mm. It says that the Workers' Party CEC has approved the formation of a disciplinary panel to look into the admissions made by MP Risa Khan in Parliament on 1st November, arising from an earlier speech made by the MP in Parliament on 3rd of August 2021. The panel comprises Secretary General Pritam Singh, Chair Sylvia Lim and Vice Chair Faisal Manap. The panel will report its findings and recommendations to the CEC after it completes its work. 
and it goes on to say that the work of the DP is separate from the COP. Yeah. Now, Miss Low, did it not strike you as surprising that this step was being taken? I mean, we talked about it earlier, and I think yeah. you said yes, that yeah. they had set up a DP to do this. Mm. And it would be surprising because actually the very people on this DP were well aware of the truth of the matter. Yeah. From a few days after the 3rd of August. Yeah. So the very people who were involved knew that it was untrue, knew that she perpetrated the untruth in Parliament again two months later, is now the only members of a DP set up and I look at the words here, to look into the admissions by Ms. Khan. Yeah. Ms. Lo, this is a completely self-serving panel, right? I, 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 admittedly, I think that's a bit of a loaded question. Yeah. But um, when I saw this, um, okay, to give, I am willing to give a bit more information. The morning of the 2nd of November, Mr. Pritam Singh had messaged me to inform me that he would be doing this. Um, and that a party would be... Put, I mean, I, I presumably the party would follow with her statement on this matter. Um, and I had relayed to him that, um, you know, I trust that they will make the right decision. I, I said that as an immediate response, but I was surprised. And later on, on hindsight, when I thought more about it, I do think that it's a major conflict of interest, yes. It's not just a major conflict of interest for which I agree with you in the first place, given now what we know they knew. Mm. But it's also self-serving in that. Does it not seek to, as I said earlier, draw a line between the Workers' Party and Ms. Khan yeah. and seek to do something which ultimately will put the blame entirely on Ms. Khan? When the disciplinary panel convened, my feelings was that, okay, it's appropriate and necessary to some degree because she did do, a, like, it's a major, it's a serious mistake that she did um, and very serious thing that she liked um, in parliament um, and therefore makes sense that she should be disciplined, yeah. But um, I disagree with how it was done and executed. My personal opinion is if they felt that disciplinary action was necessary, they should have done that from the very beginning, when they knew on the 3rd yes. of August, uh, following the 3rd of August. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. And would it not have been appropriate when such a statement is issued to disclose that actually the three members on the DP had intimate knowledge of the falsehood from an early stage and let the public judge what they do in that context if they should still continue to sit on the DP. Correct? Mm, yeah, I fully agree with that. That would be fair, right? Yeah. And that would also be fair to Ms Khan, right? Yeah. Because Ms Khan will be entitled to say, actually, I came to you. The very people who are now judging me, I came to you for guidance, for counselling, for advice, and these are the very same senior party members of the Workers' Party, right? Yeah. And so, would you not accept, um, Ms. Lowe, that the circumstances in which this DP was set up is far from usual, in fact, highly suspicious? I don't know if I would use the word suspicious. Um, if I were to give my own take on it, I feel that perhaps the three did not realise the severity or the consequences that will follow after her statement in Parliament, um, I mean, after her 1st of November statement, and that they felt necessary to then take this action to form a disciplinary panel. But, you know, Ms. Lo, we, we talked about it earlier. Yeah. Just to recount, even after the 3rd of August, there were already some commentaries, some editorials, and I, yeah. I can show them to you if you like. No, I, I am aware of them, yeah. So it's, that's, that's three months prior to this statement. Yeah, I, I am. I and then understand in October, that, yeah. if nothing else, there was, at least in the minds of these three individuals, they knew that what she was saying in Parliament on the 4th of October was false. Mm. And these are the very same people looking into 
those falsehoods and deciding what to do with her. Mm. That's highly unusual and as I said, quite suspicious, right? I would say highly unusual. I, I, I don't know if I would use the word suspicious. You said that Mr. Singh messaged you ahead of the statement being issued on mm. the 2nd of November. Yeah. Can you give us the broad gist of that discussion? Uh, it was literally just two messages. He said to me, this is happening. And then I said, okay, I trust the party leaders. I mean, I trust that the DP would, you know, make the right decision. Yeah. Did you discuss this with anyone else? In particular, Ms. Khan and Mr. Nathan? I, I believe I told Mr. Nathan. What was his reaction? He was also surprised. For the same reasons we've just been discussing. I don't know what his reasons are, but I suppose similar, yeah. What did he say to let, lead you to believe that he was surprised? I can't recall exactly, but... I, I, yeah, I can't recall exactly. But you would have those messages sent, so could you please also <laughs> yeah, make them available? I, Thank okay. you. Now, this DP, since it was set up on the 2nd of November, we understand has now com concluded its work. Were you in any way aware of what happened, who was called, what was discussed, what documents was produced to the DP? Um, so at some point after the announcement of the DP, um, as the member of the Workers' Party, I received a text message stating that the panel was now inviting comments from members of the Workers' Party and that they can sort of arrange a time to meet with the DP. Um, I don't know who has met the DP specifically, but I have. I personally made a request to meet the DP on the 25th, 25th of November. You met or you made a request to meet? Uh, I met them on the 25th. Can you outline what happened at this meeting? Uh, I gave them my honest thoughts on everything. Hang on. We'll come to that. Yeah. But first of all, where did this take place? Uh, Workers' Party headquarters. What time? My session was at 8.30. In, in the morning or evening? Uh, oh, PM. PM. Who was present? Uh, Miss, Mr. Nadan was with me and the three DP um, members. Yeah. So you went to see the DP jointly with Mr. Nadan? That's right. And... Uh, did you and Mr. Nathan discuss ahead of time what you were going to yeah, be saying? We did. You did. Can you go into the gist of those discussions, please? Mm. Um, I gave the DP my very frank opinion, which oh, is... Sorry, I, yeah. what I meant to say was, did, let tell me what you and Mr. Nathan discussed first, before telling me what you told the DP. Oh, what we discussed is exactly what we told the DP. I see. Okay. Yeah. Then please go ahead and tell me what you told the DP. Um... We came prepared with quite a number of points. Um, the first point was, uh, I mean, some context, we had a feeling that one of the decisions that they might make would be to expel Mr. Ka uh, Ms. Han from the Workers' Party um, because that was what we had seen online and amongst chatter, amongst members of the Workers' Party, that's what we knew a lot of people had on their minds. I mean, I, I mean as you can see, like a lot of newspapers also called for that. So... We went in to try and prevent them from doing that. I, I guess, to, or not prevent, but to give them our reasons for why they should not do that. Um, what were your reasons? Um, one of the reasons I gave was, you know, um, everybody makes mistakes. And while hers was very severe, um, you know, other WP MPs have also made mistakes and that... Um, expelling her would set a very bad precedent um, because then it would have, you know, basically expulsion or resigning from a post would be the only option. So those were one of my reasons. Um, another reason I gave is that I, and this is also my personal opinion, I think it's very irresponsible to leave a seat in Parliament unoccupied. Um, it, because the way I saw it, no matter how the other MPs are rotated, it felt like Compassville residents would not get the proper representation that they deserve. And that is my personal opinion. Um, I also 
told them that the CEC and especially the DP should tell the public the true timeline of events, which I have shared here today, that when they knew, you know, um, what causes of action they took, yeah, I, I told them you should make this public knowledge, um, barring confidential and personal information, meaning, you know, details of Ms. Raisa Han's life and things like that. Um, uh, I also shared with them my personal opinion of her, that she's a good, kind-hearted, compassionate person, and that that was something to be noted for and accounted for. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Did Mr. Nathan make the same points, or were there? Yeah, I mean, we made it together. Yeah. You were. You both had a consensus on these points. Mm. On your last point about the timeline, the reason you raised that is because this would be in the spirit of frank, open, transparent. And yeah, tender, I believe that. Right? Yeah. And that is necessary for people in the public to know. I fully agree with that, yeah. And not disclosing it suggests an agenda that would be unusual. I, I wouldn't say it suggests an agenda that was unusual, but um, I think it's highly unfair to Ms. Han. Yeah. And also less than honest to the public. Yes, yes. What were the questions asked of you and Mr. Nathan by the panel? They didn't ask us questions. We went there to tell them our opinions. So they just sat there in silence? <laughs> no, lah. Um, they disagreed with some of the things I shared. Um, Can you explain? I gave them and my opinion, which is, I said, if Ms. Raisa Han were to be expelled from Sinkang or from Workers' Party, that the remaining three Sinkang MPs should step down and rerun the entire GRC. And that is my personal opinion, which Ms. Sylvia Lim and Mr. Pritam Singh disagreed. And Ms. Sylvia Lim did bring up an anecdote about, I believe, the motion that Ms. Tilly An put up in Parliament many years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To explain why it ought or it need not be a natural consequence of one MP stepping down for the entire GRC to step down. Yeah, basically that you know is disproportionate to by election the whole GRC. Okay. Like, yeah. What else did they comment on or disagree on to you or Mr. Nathan? Well, I did tell I also did mention to Mr. Pritam saying that um, I mean, it, it's a connected point. So I told him, you should tell the public the truth or at least relay a timeline of the events um, because it shows his involvement in the proceedings, I mean, of what has happened. Um, and that, you know, sorry, I'm trying to sure. collect my thoughts. Um, sure. And I told him that he has a degree of responsibility on what transpired on the 4th of October um, because he's leader of the party and leader of the opposition. Um, and he could have made a clarification then if he wanted to. Yeah, and About I think it's important the public knows that. When you say tell the public the truth and uh, to make the clarification, you mean, the, you mean about his own level of involvement and knowledge and that of Ms. Lim and Mr. Manap as well? The three members were on well, on the panel. Mm, I don't know if I would agree that he would shared all of that with Parliament on the fourth of October, but I definitely do think he should have, you know, said something. Lah. Yeah. At least, if nothing else, at the very latest point in time, at the time you set up a panel comprising the very three members who knew yeah. about the falsehoods early on and who knew that it was repeated on the fourth of October, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you mean by tell the public the truth. Yeah. At when, some point, basically. <laughs> yes. Well, certainly before the point at which the DP has concluded its findings, which seems to have been done yesterday or a couple of days ago. Mm. Right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, sorry, I was trying to recall uh, the point I was trying to make. So when I shared with Mr. Singh my thoughts, um, he had a disagreement with me that 
he gave her a choice on the 4th of October, which is, you know, him saying, I won't judge you. Yeah, he reiterated that. Um, so he disagreed with me in the sense that he didn't think it was explicitly his responsibility to step up and clarify. So he's saying that despite knowing that what was said on the 3rd of August was untrue, was false, he was prepared to sit back and listen to another of his party members in Parliament in answer to questions by the Cabinet Minister, repeat the falsehoods, perpetrate the untruths two months later, and that was a choice he's prepared to make as leader of the party. Was that, is that an accurate summary of what he said to you? I, I don't know if that's an accurate summary, but as I said, when he says to her, I will not judge you, he should have prepared for an either or consequence. Meaning he should be prepared that if this thing results in an inquiry like it has done now, that he should be prepared to step up yeah. and accept responsibility for his role and yeah. knowledge. Is that what you mean? Yeah. When you made the point about coming clean to tell the public the truth, what was the reaction of the other two members of the panel? They didn't say anything. They just like nodded their heads and jotted down like I said. They didn't disagree with you? No. All right. They didn't say anything. La, so I don't know if they agreed or disagreed. Is there a recording of what happened? Who, keep, who kept notes of what happened at the... the there was the no session? recording. Like, you know, uh, no phone or whatever. And I, don't, I didn't see anyone taking minutes. But all three were taking notes. So they had their own notes? Yeah. And did you come prepared with something in writing? Did you give something to them? Uh, so I, uh, it was like kind of in my phone and in my head. And then um, I had to put my phone away because they didn't allow me to bring my phone in. So I jotted it down on the paper, but I threw that away already. Okay. All right. And so what you've given us is as best as you can remember uh, yeah. an account. Correct. But it is likely that the Workers' Party DP would have kept notes of what you said to them. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I don't know to what extent of the... I mean, how thorough the notes are. Yes, but you did see them taking down some notes as you were speaking. Yeah. Right. right. Now, a few more questions on the DP. Do you know who else went before the DP to give... Because you said that there was a message you received to yeah. come and give your comments to the DP, right? I, I don't know who else went to the DP. When did you receive this message? Uh, SMS? Yes. When, did, when was it? When? Uh, uh, I can't remember. A day or two after the 2nd of November, or is it closer to when you met with them, which is 25th of November? I, I can't remember, but I can go and check my phone. That would yeah. be useful. Thank you. Uh, going back to my earlier question, do you know if any other activist or volunteer or cadre member went to see the DP? No, the to my knowledge, the DP is strictly for members. Okay. Did Miss Khan see the DP? Um, to my knowledge, yeah, she, I mean, she didn't, she wasn't one of the, uh, I mean, she's the subject of inquiry, right? Yes. So I think she did meet the DP um, at some point, but I don't think she went there as like in response to the call for members to, yeah, okay. meet with did, the DP. Did she share with you what was discussed at the DP? Um, no, not in, not in tremendous detail. Tell yeah. us what detail she gave you. Um, First of all, when did she see the DP? I know that I can't again. I I don't know. I'm not privy of the exact you know timing and day and things like that. But at some point, she did meet the DP. Um, I believe she met them twice. The first one, I'm not sure when, and I also. Sorry, I'm not fully aware of um. What exactly was exchanged, um. I think they just had, you know, uh, I think from what she shared with me, there were some questions and she had gone in to like answer them. La. Yeah. And then I know she met again uh, on the day with, uh, I think she met them actually this, this Monday, the Monday that just passed. That would have been the... 
29th of November. She shared with me, yeah. Orally or my messaging? Orally. Can you give us a gist of what happened? She said that they were strongly encouraging her. Okay, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm making this up. Like, I'm, I, Not that I'm making things up, but no, I want to be careful with yes. the words that I use because, you know, I wasn't part of this conversation. It was secondhand information. Yes. Yeah, Miss Lo, I... I I mean, you're right in being careful, so I, I thank you for yeah. that. But what, what we want you to do is just to recount what she said. I know, I know. Um, I think she she said, I mean, she was quite emotional on the phone. Okay, that's first of all. And second, she said that they, they asked her to think about resignation. Yeah. What was her reaction to that? She was very, very upset. And she was upset because she... She didn't... Did, at that did. point of time, on Monday, she had not wanted to resign. And in fact, the thrust of your submission to the DP was why she should not be expelled Correct. or made to resign, right? Yeah. Because you felt that, well, besides the excuse, the reasons you've given, people make mistakes, you also felt that this was something where the senior leadership had been aware and yeah. Had acted in, if not based on their advice, at least with their acquiescence and their knowledge. Yes. Right? So those are the reasons why you felt that she should not be expelled. And I... I mean, many reasons, lah, as I said. like One, I think it's not right to leave the residents of Compassville unrepresented in Parliament. Um, second, that they were involved in the sense that they had knowledge of... You know, her, the lie is her mistake, yes, but thereafter they are involved. Mm. And, you know, as you said, it's like, you know, a few months worth of, you know, back and forth sort of thing. Um, yeah. And this few months of back and forth, at least these three members of the DP Yeah, were at least the three involved, of them knew. Correct? Mm. Not just knew, but I think they were intimately involved because they knew what was happening shortly after the 3rd of August and they also gave comments and crafted a statement on the 1st of November. Um... So, I don't know if Mr. Faisal Manap was involved in the crafting of the statement. I only know that at least Mr. Singh and Ms. Sylvia Lim was involved. So, yeah. what I just said applies certainly to Mr. Singh and Mr. Lim, yeah. but not so sure about Mr. Manap. Yeah. Right? What was Ms. Han's reaction to being asked to think about resigning? She was, as I said, very, very upset. Yeah. But we now know that she has done so. Yes. When you spoke with her on the phone, you said she was emotional. Mm -hmm. Did you, from your perspective, I'm not asking you to read her mind per se, but from your perspective, from what she said and how she sounded, did you think she felt pressured to resign? No, I don't think she felt pressured. Mm. <laughs> and but in the context of a discussion like this, yeah. and again, let me paint the context. There was a falsehood, yes, it's a mistake. Discussed with senior party leaders. Discussed with Mr. Singh before 4th of October, mm. where she expected to face questions, further questions on this. Mm. He was in chamber. Uh, meeting at his home on the 12th of October. Discussions thereafter on what to do. No mention of consequences. No mention of a DP in particular. And certainly no mention of you having to step down and resign. Mm. In that context... I'm saying, would she not have, at the very least, felt unnerved or affected by the suggestion that she should now resign? And with that, with that, signal that she should take responsibility for what has happened entirely. Um, she was definitely unnerved. Um... But I think they were also careful to not instruct. Which is why I think I said that the resignation was something she should consider. Mm -hmm. But I think even an acknowledgement that that is something that she should do or consider taking 
was very disappointing to her. And unexpected. I wouldn't say unexpected, as I said, because a lot of people have been calling for her resignation. Yes, but yeah. this, a lot of people are basically outsiders. They are people in the press, people in the media, third parties. I'm focused on the people who actually knew what was happening. In that context, given what had transpired, mm. from Ms Khan's perspective, it would have been unexpected. Again, I wouldn't use the term unexpected because it was something that I think people knew were on the cards, but um, even Ms Han herself. But I think she felt very let down. Yeah. And... Just Again, this is an assumption of how I think she felt. Of course. She will come and give evidence as well, and we will ask her that. Yeah. But it's useful from your perspective, and I thank you very much for that. Just want to confirm, too, that she had not discussed or broached the subject of either the, having a disciplinary inquiry or panel or having to step down. That was not something that she had told you was discussed between herself and Mr. Singh or Ms. Lim or Mr. Manam, correct? Discussed as in right, like prior right. to her statement. Prior, prior to her statement. Yeah, no, she, there was, n yeah, it was all new. La. Yeah. Okay. Now, when Ms. Khan went before the disciplinary panel, and as we saw, the panel was set up to look into the false statements, and I'm paraphrasing, false statements and her admission of the false statements, and what now to do with her. That's the thrust of the panel's terms of reference, as it were, right? Mm -hmm. Would not one answer by Ms. Khan be that, hey, why are you asking me this? You all knew all along what has been happening. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what she thought about it. Nah. But, oh, um, actually I do. Uh, sorry, I'm just recalling now. I think when the Please DP was... That with us. Uh, when the DP was convened, she expressed surprise. Yeah. And? Can you elaborate? Uh, uh, I, I, I suppose she didn't... She, Again, I, I don't want to be putting words in her mouth, but I think maybe to some degree she felt a bit betrayed because, again, you know, there was no inkling that it might happen. Uh, yeah, Yeah, I mean, no inkling that it might happen. And you, you said betrayed, presumably because you felt that since she's been... She had been transparent them, with them from the start. Open yeah. to them, yes. Transparent, in your words, open. Consulting even, getting mm. advice on what to do. Meeting at his home. And mm. then suddenly to see mm. that there's an inquiry mm. culminating maybe a few days ago. in an yeah, I, I don't know if she met at his place, but they had meetings. Or you uh, did, but yeah, she, I did, might, yeah. she might have. Yeah. So, but culminating in a suggestion to consider resigning was certainly the backdrop to why you say you think she felt betrayed. Yeah. Right. Um... Can I ask you to please look at the statement issued by the party? This one? Uh, maybe my uh, clubs could assist me, please. The s statement issued by the Workers' Party on the... There isn't a date, but I think this is... Oh, it's the same one. 30th of November, right? Do you have a copy with you? Uh, the 2nd of November? No, the 30th of November. I don't have that. This is, this is the 2nd of November statement. 30th the November. Both, this is two, both are the same. I need the 30th. I, I presume you're referring to WP's statement on her resignation? Yes, that's right. Do you have that? No, I don't well, have maybe, it. Maybe uh, no, this the disciplinary panel. Yeah, this, I think this lady behind will give you a copy. Yes, that's the one. Thank you. 
So, Ms. Lo, this you would have seen the statement. Yeah, I did. It's a short statement. It just says that she has resigned from the party. Yeah. Talks about the, the CEC meeting on the 30th of November, mm. which I think you also referred to earlier. Mm. Uh, and then it talks about Ms. Khan at 4.30 on the 30th of November, indicating her wish to resign. Mm. And then a party press conference that will be held on the 2nd of December. So the circumstances that we have just been discussing in relation to the calling of the BDP, her intentions, her thinking, and so on, the background information, all of that should be read in the context, or rather this statement ought to be read in the context of all that has happened mm. to fully understand why it is and how it is that Ms Khan has now come to resign from the party, right? Mm. Do you have any uh, knowledge in relation to why she decided to resign at 4.30 on the 30th of November before the CEC meeting? Mm, I do. Can you um, share that with us, please? She had called... <clears throat> um, she had called... I, I can't remember if she had called me or I had called her um, earlier that day. Um, but I think we had a phone call and she had expressed to me her desire to resign. And I tried to... I mean, I tried to discourage her from it again and again because I, I've told you all the reasons why I think it was not the correct thing to do. Um, um, but I think she felt that she just couldn't continue with the knowledge that she already had. Yeah. The knowledge that she had, can you be a bit more precise? What is that? The knowledge that she had been asked to consider resignation. Yes. So that was a key factor for her. Yeah, and definitely her final, like, her decision to resign is definitely hers alone. Yes. Yeah. Um, but you would say influenced by a key factor, which is... Yeah, I would say it was influence. Yeah. So, I mean, put it this way, Miss Lo, you know, whether you're an employer, employee, mm. or a member or of a party, yeah. if the employer or the party has signaled that you should consider resigning, yeah. I think that's a very powerful statement, right? Yes, and I think for her, she felt like she no longer had the support needed to continue, yeah, and which is why she decided to to resign. Yes. Yeah. And so she decided to do it even before the CEC met. Yeah. Do you know what happened at the CEC meeting on the 30th of November? No, I don't know. I mean, I know basically what's here, la, that she met them. She said, you know, I would like to resign. Yeah. Okay. I, I know it's been a while and I... Sorry to keep you here. Mm, I just have it's a few okay. more questions to wrap up so that we are, we are clear on the facts, okay? Mm. On the... On the... Ms. Khan's involvement with the DP, I just want to get the dates right so mm. that I'm clear. The DP was set up on... at least announced on the 2nd of November. Mm. And then you told me that at some stage there was a mass notice to members to come and give yeah. statements. And you don't know who and how many went to give statements, yeah. right? But... You do know that Ms. Khan went to the DP on two occasions. She, I don't know. She, yeah, she met the DP on two occasions. Yeah. Is it two or at, or at least two occasions? At least two. At least two. Uh, would you be able to give me the rough dates? If you don't know them now, presumably you might have been told by Ms. Khan before she went that she was going and you might then be able to see a message trail. Yeah, I will have to go and look at my messages. Could yeah. you please do that so that yeah. we have a timeline for this? Yeah. Okay? Did you and Ms. Han dis discuss what materials she should prepare to go for this meeting with the DP? Did me and Ms. Han discuss? Yes. Um, I think she was asked to provide some evidence. Um, and I had met up with her on Deepa Valley. Um, it was public holiday and I knew she was feeling really down. So I offered to visit her at her place and we briefly discussed it where 
I know she was asked to provide some evidence. La. That was the discussion we had about her first meeting with the DP. What, what kind of evidence was, was she asked to produce? Uh, I think, you know, about why she lied and, you know, anything related to perhaps the support group. But what's the nature of this evidence going to do for the DP when the DP already knew that she had lied and she had given a statement and she repeated it on the 4th of October? I'm, I'm not sure. Did you help her to prepare any notes of uh, um, what she would say? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we had a crash on our computer here. Oh. Just need one moment. Uh. Okay. Sorry. Rich. Okay. Can I uh, offer you any more water or? Yeah, yes, please. Could you please help her with some water? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Miss Lo, sorry, you were in the middle of an answer. I asked you just to repeat, what's the nature of going of this evidence going to do when the DP already knew that she had lied, given a statement, and repeated it on the 4th of October? Um, my answer, I think, was I don't know. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I had to ask you again because they didn't capture the answer. Okay. Um, and then you mentioned that you met her at home on Deeper Valley, which I have ascertained to be the 4th of November. Yeah. So, by the 4th of November, she knew she was going to be facing this DP, but had not yet seen them. Uh, yeah, correct. But by that time, she had already been asked to produce evidence. Yeah, correct. Right? Yeah. Do you know how they communicated with her to produce this evidence? I believe it was via email. By email. Okay. And did she share the email with you? Uh, no, she didn't. She just told me. Okay. And... Roughly, if you can remember, how long after the 4th of November did she go and see the DP? I can't remember. After she saw the DP for the first time, did she discuss it with you? Did you get a debrief? I can't remember. I will have to check. Okay. And then she had her second meeting before or after your 25th November meeting with the DP? After. After. Yeah, she... I, as I said, she met them, I believe, on the morning of 29th November, Monday. I see. And that was the second meeting. Yeah. And you're not aware if there might have been a third one before the yeah. 30th of November? No, I'm not aware. Um, am I allowed to add something? Yes, of course. Um, a lot of the things that I'm sharing here today is shared with me by Miss Han in my capacity as a friend and a confidant. Yeah. Um, and I believe that technically I'm not supposed to know a lot of these things. Yes. I understand the context in which it was shared with you. But here in the context of this question that mm. we are tasked to look into, yeah. we do have to evaluate the factual circumstances. I understand. And we do I'm have to reach conclusions on them. Yeah. So what you share with us will be helpful for yeah. us to reach a holistic view on this. I mean, I want to be as truthful as I can, but I'm just, you know, yeah. clarifying that. Yes, of course. Yeah. We have just reinforced the point. I think we are fact-finding. Yeah. And we understand the circumstance yeah. because as you're aware... What has transpired in Parliament is, is serious. Um, yeah. uh, and while she has admitted it, we are also assessing uh, her culpability. Mm -hmm. Are there mitigating factors and so on? Mm -hmm. So I think the full context of it, as explained by Minister Edwin, um, it's important for us. I understand. So I understand the, the tensions you might feel because some of these things are shared in confidence. But yeah. I hope you understand the context, um, why it's important for us to understand so that we can eventually evaluate and ascertain why it happened, how it happened, and I guess the degree to which she bears responsibility for actions. 
I I understand. It's just, I, I have I admittedly I don't feel comf- fully comfortable because, I mean she trusted me lah. I understand. Yeah. I understand. And uh, we appreciate uh, what you're sharing with us. Okay, Miss Lo, I I just have a couple more questions to ask you, and I want to focus on, um, the request by the police to interview Miss Khan. Mm-hmm. Um. Maybe the best thing to do is just show you a document because it's probably shortcuts the, okay. the facts. Could the, could the clerks assist me, please? This is a copy of a police statement issued on the 20th of October. Thank you. So it, it sets out some dates in there. Just to refresh, 3rd August was the parliamentary sitting. 4th October was the exchange with Minister Shanmugam. And then it goes into the fourth paragraph here and says that there's an email sent on the 7th of October and again on the 15th of October inviting Ms Han to get in touch with the police for an interview. Now, pausing for a moment, were you aware of this at the time it happened? Yeah, she did share with me that the police had emailed her. Was there a discussion on what the appropriate response ought to be? Uh, I mean, I, I had just reacted like a, you know, like, like a, n- not necessarily like a, oh my gosh, but like a, oh no, you know, kind of thing. Um, but beyond that, I didn't, I can't recall if I, um, we discussed it lah. But I think I might have. Suggested that, you know, she should go and find a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Not necessarily the best thing to do. Always. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, I, 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 as a friend, I was like, there's absolutely nothing I can do to help you at this point. So somebody who, who is more professional at this would, you know, would be better. Yeah. But um, was there a discussion on what she should do? I mean, should she see the police? Should she respond? I, I, I didn't discuss that with her. I see. I just said, yeah, go lawyer. <laughs> Do you know if she discussed it with anyone within Workers' Party? Um, I believe later on she did inform Mr. Pritam Singh. Yeah, I Do think at know? some point she told me she shared it with him. Right. Do you know what his response was to this? No, I don't know. Okay. Is there any reason that you can shed light as to why she did not respond to the, the two police emails? No, I, I can't. I don't know why she no. didn't respond. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got no further questions for Ms. Lowe. Thank you very much, Ms. Ms. Lowe. Okay. I, I appreciate that you've been trying your best to help us with the details, and I appreciate yeah. it very much. Mr. Graceful. Thank you very much, Ms. Lowe. If uh, you allow me, I'll actually refer to something that you said earlier on, quite early in the process. Mm. You'll just repeat what you have said and captured here. Um, please let us know if it's not captured accurately. Yeah? Uh, she told us this is in response to your Zoom discussion with um, Ms. Khan as well as um, Mr. Na- Nathan. Nathan. Yeah. She told us that she had lied because she was once a victim or survivor herself of sexual assault. She relayed to us that this has happened when she was overseas, when she was 18, and that she had sought I guess, to heal from this episode by attending support groups. And that's when she learned of this anecdote. Uh, Without going into specifics about, you know, her circumstances, did she um, uh, share with you whether the support group was actually held in Singapore or in the US? Because I understand that what has happened to her actually happened in the US. Um. I don't know if it happened in the US, yeah, but um, I surprisingly have never asked her that question. Um, but uh, sh- I, yeah, sorry, I, I lost track of my thought there, but yeah, the, the, the support group is in Singapore. So actually, you have actually in her discussion confirmed with her that she has attended support groups in Singapore. Mm, correct. Thank you. statements earlier. I just have a couple of questions which I 
thought, you know, would give us better sense of her thinking and her reflections. Mm. Um, you know, we've already established the part that confidentiality was not um, necessary la, for her to um, put forth the case that she wanted to make and in, in therefore doing that made a false statement. So, um, but, you know, in the last general election, she also raised another point about, you know, the police, you know, and how they discriminated against certain segments and race. Mm. Um, do you know whether there is an agenda, you know, in her mind um, against the police or agencies of law, or people, law? Um, and then, you know, whether, you know, that, you know, was, 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 was an agenda that motivated her mm. enough to make this lie? No, there was no agenda. She she really like just wanted to help sexual assault victims. Okay, but you know, there's a certain pattern that you see, you know, against I, the I police understand. and the law. Yeah, but my understanding of her character and her personality and having worked with her in the last one and a half years, that was not her agenda. Okay. Yeah. The 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 second question I had was between um, August seven and eight and before first November, um, was it ever in her mind um, before the disability committee spoke to her about resigning that resignation or coming clean uh, would be something to do mm, sorry i don't fully so understand basically means it, at, at any point before she was asked to resign by the resignation committee whether or you know whether whether she ever considered coming clean before being forced to come clean on 1st november or to consider resignation as a as an act, you know, because right before the first of November. Yes. Um, at some point of our, you know, discussions between just me and her, I think there was, I felt the stress that she was feeling, and I did tell her that as a friend, and and I say this completely as a friend. I said. If it's too much to bear, you know, you can resign. Yeah. Um, but she immediately said no, and she said that's not the right thing to do. Like, she wanted to do the right thing for her residents, um, and that she should come clean. Yeah. And in, in, in her view in saying that, you know, she does not feel that, you know, that failure to be truthful and honest and not living up to the expectations in terms of integrity of her, Member of Parliament, a representative of the people. I think that didn't occur to her in terms of what she had done and this reflection. I, I don't think that's accurate. I think, I mean, definitely she feels very guilty. And she's very aware that it's a very serious offence. Uh, I mean, not, uh, I don't know if I will use the word offence, but a very serious thing to do. Lah. Yeah. Um, and, and she's fully aware of that. And she feels very bad. Yeah. Um, which is, I mean, my personal take is that, yeah, it was definitely her mistake to lie, and it was definitely something she shouldn't do, but it also took a lot of courage for her to come clean on the 1st of November, knowing that a lot of this would follow, um, and also at the same time having to reveal a very private aspect of herself that even her parents did not know um, until very recently. I, I mean, so I think that courage stems from her desire to want to do the right thing and, you know, and also because she probably felt guilty about lying to Parliament. Yeah. What, what part of it was also um, that sense that she had, that she had the support of the party and leadership to continue, despite knowing that, you know, this is what she's done so far? I would say that that's true, that she felt that she had the support at the time. From the leadership and the yeah. CEC? Mm. Thank you. So Don Rick. Hi, Ms. Lo. Hi. Um, so Workers' Party held a press conference, which ended about half an hour ago. Oh, so it was in the morning. I didn't know what time it was. Yeah. <laughs> so during the conference, um, Mr. Pitam Singh actually informed the press that the leadership was aware of the untruth a week after... Uh, the October 3rd sitting. So he also mentioned that he had told Ms. Khan to, to clarify uh, in October. So do you agree with this statement? 
So he told the public that he only knew one week after the 4th of October. Yep, and he also told Ms. Khan to repeat the untruth and clarify in Parliament in October. Despite, however, despite being asked to do so, Ms. Khan did not do so. So Mr. Pitam Singh said that a moment ago. All I can say is that's very disappointing to hear. At the same time, he also told the press that he had told Ms. Khan to contact the victim and any relevant individuals as the authorities will be likely to seek clarification from Ms. Khan. Did Ms. Khan actually tell you that the party leadership actually t told um, her to... They might have, but I, I don't know this part. Thank you. Mr. Dennis Tan. No questions. Uh, Mr. Desmond Lee. Good afternoon, Ms. Lo. Just Hi. Some, yeah. some basic questions. Mm. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of... Uh, Mr. Lim Hang Ling, mm. who is uh, on our uh, agenda sheet, the legislative assistant, yeah. the member of parliament, former member of parliament for Sengkang GRC, Ms. Raisha Khan. Are you um, um, aware of this gentleman? Yeah, um, we know him as Mike. Mike. Yeah, he doesn't like his Chinese name. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what is his role uh, as a legislative assistant from your understanding? Um, his role as the legislative assistant, I think it's a bit different from perhaps PAP MPs. Um, from WP MPs, the legislative assistant primarily looks after groundwork, um, such as organizing events, um, you know, rostering like house visits, um, doing you know estate walks and things like that. So that is his primary responsibility. He also, uh, I guess, sometimes assists with you know. Mm, following up with like estate management matters, for example, you know, there's like a dustbin that's very full and things like that. He would help relay that concern back to town council. Because in the uh, earlier evidence you gave uh, uh, this morning, uh, mm. you mentioned uh, Mr. Nathan and yourself principally, but made no mention of this uh, gentleman, yeah. Mr. Lim. Mm. Um, from your understanding, was he involved in? any of the relevant speeches uh, that Ms. Khan had made? No, not at all. <laughs> and I think if when you meet Mr. Lim, I, I presume you all haven't met him yet. No. Yeah, when you meet him, you'll understand he's not, yeah, he, he doesn't really get involved at all with legislative work specifically, like parliamentary work, yeah. But uh, in relation to the matters of the 3rd of, of, 3rd of August and subsequently uh, in October, do you know if Mr. Mike Lim was involved? No, he in did not know. Yeah, he only knew, like, pretty much when the statement was about to be made. Yeah. The November statement. Yeah, the correct. November. Yeah. Right. Thank you. No further questions. Ms. Rahul Yumazan. Thank you very much for your um, answers earlier. I just wanted to get some clarification on some points, just to understand your relationship with Ms. Raisa Khan. Actually, yeah. you seem to know her very well. You've had a friendship way before she came into politics? Not at all, actually. I did not know her even when she... I mean, we were acquainted for the purposes of the general election because she was running as a candidate. Um, but prior to that, I was not a friend of hers. Like, we, we were not personally acquainted, uh, like, close friends or anything. Yeah. But through the course of work, you actually know Correct. her very through, well and understand Yeah, through the course of working as a secretarial assistant in the last one-ish year, yeah, I got to know her pretty well. Okay. Um, I wanted to just go to the point um, where, you know, um, if you recall, she was asked on 1st of November by Leader of the House um, to explain why she put the untruths. And she gave two main points. Um, one was because of her concern of um, the confidentiality point because she wanted to protect the people involved. And we've established earlier that she didn't actually need to raise that. Um, the second point was the fact that she was also facing her own challenges in terms of... Um, facing up to her own experiences. Um, I wanted to ask, in terms of crafting those parts of the speech, um, are you aware to what extent that came from her and to what extent that came from, say, inputs and feedback from the people who were helping her? Um, sorry, you are referring to which speech? The one on the 1st of November, the clarifatory speech, where she gave her clarification. Uh, no, her clarifications were all her own. Nobody prepared that for she her. She did that on her own? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, I just wanted to get one point, which I believe um, Minister Edwin had elaborated a bit, but you made this point, which I wanted to understand a bit better, because I think we were discuss we were, you were being asked about the timelines and how you felt very strongly that that should be something that we should openly say. Mm. And you made a comment about how, you know, also that it would be highly unfair to Miss Khan. Yeah. Um, could you just elaborate what you meant by that? If it was not, um, if it was not disclosed, um, that you know the full timeline that would have been very unfair to her. Why did you feel that way? As I said, I, my this is again my personal opinion, um, and I stress personal and opinion. Um, my belief is Miss Han's mistake. And the extent of her mistake is lying in Parliament on the three occasions. Um, but beyond that, she is not a sole actor in how things transpired. And when she could, she when when she felt the need to come clean, she had informed leadership of the matter. Um, and therefore, you know, it, it it wasn't aware. It wasn't like they didn't know. Yeah, so I felt that it's not very fair that on the public level, it looks like everything is just on her. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I, I've, I've since looked at some of the press coverage of events which the Workers' Party press conference touches, which also touches on the points which I had raised with Ms. Lowe earlier. So may I have your permission to put some points to her on that basis? Yes, please. Ms. Lowe, I'm looking at this literally as I speak with you. Yeah. But there are several points which cut across what we have been discussing earlier, and yeah. I'd like to get your clarification on it. And this is based on the media reports. CNA reports Mr. Singh as saying that Ms. Khan had repeated the untruth in Parliament in October, despite being asked to clarify the matter then. That's one statement. Mr. Singh is also quoted as saying that initially, and this is in quotes, initially, Raisha stuck to her untruth in her communications with me. He is also quoted as saying, after being repeatedly pressed, which I take it to mean after Ms. Han is repeatedly pressed. A number of new facts and disturbing personal revelations were disclosed. These concern Raisha's sexual assault and events which were unknown to the party leadership at that time and other related matters of a deeply personal nature. She admitted this to the party leadership about a week after she had delivered her speech. Adding, sorry, adding that these personal traumas explain why she had not been truthful in her account. Let me just pause there for a moment. I mean, those are the verbatim quotes. Hmm. Is it, does it cohere with your own sense of what happened when Mr. Singh says that Ms. Khan stuck to her untruth in her communications with me? No, it doesn't. Um, and I would like to share, now that I know that this has happened, I would like to share a couple of my thoughts about it. Um, admittedly, I am not privy to the specifics of the conversation between Ms. Han and Mr. Pritam Singh. So there's a degree, there might be a degree of interpretations of what might have transpired between the two of them. And perhaps in you know separate occasion, they might you know, have misremembered certain things and told me a different account of things. But I'm quite sure, and I don't know if I already mentioned this earlier, so while Miss Han told me on the 7th of August the truth, I had a meeting with Mr. Pritam Singh on the 10th of August on a separate matter. And while we were waiting, and <laughs> poor Mr. Yudhishtra Nadu was also with me at this meeting about this other separate matter. We are very good friends, okay? Um, uh, briefly, Mr. Pritam Singh confirmed that he knew with me. I, we didn't talk about it explicitly because we you know, didn't want to say it out loud, but 
I had briefly conversed on the matter with him and his acknowledgement of it suggested to me that he knew. Yeah, which is why I would like to also add that I'm, I'm really upset that that did not get shared with the public. Well, this occasion was not shared with the public. Neither was the occasion prior to the 4th of October when Ms Han went to Parliament to, in the expectation in your words, when he had a sense that this was going to be raised again. You recall you said that to us. Yeah. And then she, she met with Ms Han, presumably to prepare for what to say in Parliament. Yeah. And um, can I just add, whatever Mr Pritam Singh has relayed to me, Mr. Yusra is my witness that I received this information okay. because he received the same. Okay. He was present with me on many of these occasions. I understand. And I wanted to add on to what I just said earlier on the 4th of October incident because Mr. Singh is quoted as saying, and I quote in, from the CNA report, that Ms. Han, in quote, repeated an untruth on the parliamentary record which was wholly inconsistent with the revelations she had shared with the party leadership after, October, after August 3rd. Almost immediately after Parliament adjourned in October, Raisha agreed with the party leadership that she had to set the record right forthwith. I shared with her that it was the correct thing to do. The earliest, the next earliest opportunity to do so was, in, was on November 1st. Pausing for a moment, this account, assuming this is all that was said, mm. misses out a number of, on a number of key details yeah. right, that we had discussed. Yeah which would shed light on the internal knowledge of Mr. Singh and two other senior members of the Workers' Party, correct? Yeah. And, in fact, the earliest opportunity to do so was not November 1st, because, as you remember, there were intervening police emails. Hmm. He added that Ms. Han sent her resignation letter on November 30th. Again, it misses out on some context which we had discussed earlier about the background to how she had felt that she had lost the confidence of the party and felt that she had to resign. I don't know if she lost the confidence of the party but she didn't feel like she didn't she didn't feel like she had the support. Yeah. Let me just quote another portion to you. When asked why the claim was allowed to remain uncorrected, Mr. Pritam Singh said, and I quote, each Workers' Party MP is a leader in his or her own right. And if you have done something wrong, it is your responsibility to set the record right. Further on, he is quoted as saying, but only Raisha knew the truth of what she had said and what she had experienced. And it is for her to clarify that on the record. And I think that would have been only adequately communicated through her personally. Again, Miss Lowe, this yeah. doesn't accord with the sequence of events and in some ways, if I can paraphrase it, the trust that Miss Han placed in the senior leadership by going to them first, shortly after the 3rd of August. Yeah. Correct? Um, again, I, 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 I'm not... Obviously, I'm very aware now that what Mr. Pritam Singh is saying to the public and what I've shared here is very different, especially with matters con before 4th of October. Um, I'm not privy to the specifics of the conversation between him and Ms. Han. Yes. I only have, you know, summaries um, transpired, the, of what transpired by, given to me by both of them. I understand. Yeah. But from that perspective, and I'm not asking you to second guess what Mr. Singh had in his mind. I'm asking you based on what you know of communications you heard directly from Ms. Han. This would not accord with how the events played out, given what we know about the level of knowledge within the Workers' Party, correct? Yes. I'll go on to say that um, the press then asked Mr. Singh some questions and... This is what the report says, and I read it to you. In response to questions over why Ms. Han did not follow orders to clarify the matter in October, Mr. Singh added, why she didn't take heed of that instruction? Why did she ignore it? That is not a question I can answer. First of all, 
to characterize the October, the pre-October 4th meeting as an instruction to speak the truth is quite at odds with what I think you had shared with us earlier. Yeah. Correct? Yes, and I would like to add a bit to this. Um, when I met the disciplinary panel on the 25th of November, Mr. Pritam Singh had tried to relate to me again this episode where he supposedly spoke to her and asked her to speak the truth. And the way that he had told, he had talked about it when I met him on the disciplinary panel was very different from what he shared with me at his place on the 12th of October, which is why I would like to stress that the only person who can account for what he said to me in the specifics of I will not judge you is Mr. Yudhishthira Nadan because we both heard it together. All right. We, 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 I will make a request to Mr. Speaker, the Chairman, to call Mr. Nadan so that yeah. he, can, he can testify to that and also corroborate your account. Yeah. But I want to focus on what you said earlier about the difference between what was said on the 12th of October that evening at his home and what was said at the DP. Yeah. There was an intervening period of about five weeks. Yeah. And what I think I understand from you, which I'd like you to clarify, is this. That on the 12th of October, the position taken was, we won't judge you, meaning we will be behind you, we will, you take a, a view, and you know, we know. But on the 25th of November, that characterization changed mm. to one where he is trying to impress upon you and Mr. Nathan that in fact, prior to the October sitting, he had told her, and in the words of the CNA report, given her an order to mm. tell the truth. And that is the difference, correct? Correct. And if I were to say to you that based on your impression of your interactions with Ms. Han, the characterization of the discussion between her and Mr. Singh as an order to tell the truth would be wrong, right? Again, I... I, I, uh... I know you, you have not heard you were not privy to the direct conversation, but yeah. I'm asking you to judge it based on what you were told firsthand from Ms. Hart. Yeah, and I mean, when he says, I will not judge you, I think in his mind, it's an instruction, perhaps, and that's why he's coming out to say this. But again, if you take that forward at face value, uh, it could go either way, right? Like, I mean, that, yeah. That you have said earlier. Yeah. But I think there's a stark difference in the way in which it is being characterized, correct? Yeah. And it, so, in my perspective, when he said it to me, I will not judge you that he had told her this. It's a, uh, you know, he's saying that, oh, she acted on her own, you know? And that was the sense he was giving me. But as a person receiving that information, in my mind, it could go either way. Yeah. Well, certainly, Ms. Han didn't take away from the conversation with Mr. Singh that there was a direct instruction for her to go and tell the truth the next right. day, right? Yeah. I if, mean, if she had, yeah. she would have told you. I don't know if that would be accurate to say that if she had, she would have told me. Um, well, Ms. Because I didn't know that that conversation took place. Until later. Until yes. later. But yeah. let's put it this way. If on the 12th of October, if... On the 12th of October, and I think just to refresh on the facts, Ms. Han spoke to you or communicated with you, and then you destroyed yourself, met with Mr. Singh at night mm. at his home. If there was an instruction earlier which she breached, that would have been the starting point of that discussion on the 12th of October, right? Correct. But that wasn't. No, it wasn't. Yes. And if Ms. I mean, you know Miss Han well. I would say decently. Reasonably well. Yeah. And I think you had her well-being in your, in your mind. I think you made that very clear from the start, that yeah. you're concerned with her well-being, which, which is correct. You would have... She would have come to you, if not for advice, at least for counsel, if she was told by her party leader to speak the truth and come clean on the 12th of October, correct? Given how things have been occurring, yeah, I would believe that if she would received the explicit advice prior to the 4th of October, she would have told me. Yes. And in fact, you contrast what happened before 4th of October and what happened before 1st of November, where her family was concerned, where there were issues about the draft, 
looking over the draft by Mr. Singh, Ms. Lim, yourself, Mr. Nathan, Ms. Khan herself, her family. My point is, going into an occasion like the 1st of November where she knew she was going to come clean and had to do so was quite a different one from the 4th of October, isn't it? Yeah, it was very different. Um, obviously, the revelation would be a shock. Like, I think everyone understands that. And we understood that the moment she told me the truth, which is why we treated it with great caution. And I would imagine that if she received the instruction prior to the 4th of October, it would have been done the same. It would have been done the same. I mean, from all that you know of Miss Han, I mean, had she received the instruction prior to the 4th of October, what she did on 1st of November, she would have done on the 4th of October. Correct. She wouldn't have stood there and you saw the video quite confidently taking a position. Correct. You see, the, the reality is, I, I mean, I, I, I believe, speaking for myself, that it is not plausible nor believable that Ms. Han acted in, in this entire sequence of events entirely on her own without mm. consulting with and getting the advice of senior party members. Yeah. Would you accept that? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. No, no further questions. Uh, just two simple questions to follow up. Some of them has been covered just for my understanding. <clears throat> I think coming back again to the statement that uh, Ms. Khan made, uh, with regards to her own background, which is obviously very personal and difficult to make public, um, there is really no need to go into the fact that that she belonged to a support group and why she was in a support group was also because of what had happened to her. In explaining the context of why she described the story of accompanying that lady, um, would you agree that really there is, you could actually recount that whole account without going into your own personal details. Would that be a, a fair comment? She could, but it's not the complete truth, right? So from your perspective, she f that was her reason for wanting to raise this whole issue because of her background, and therefore she wanted to share that part as part of the statement. I believe well. what she shared with me, yeah. Okay, thank you. The other question, again, um, I guess has been sort of raised by Minister Edwin Tong, really is this which has come out in the press conference, uh, and you've quite explained, I just wanted to be clear again, um, that she was told uh, on 4th October to come clean and explain. Uh, but again, from your perspective it, and your interactions with her and communications with her, uh, since, and also from your own interaction with Mr. Pritam, which Mr. Nathan was there as well, you did not get the impression that that was the instructions given uh, for her to actually explain everything on 4th October. Yeah, again, the only, the only information I have um, from their meeting on the 3rd of October, I believe, um, is that he said those four words to her. I will not judge you. Okay, understand. Okay, I have no further questions. Anyone, uh, Mr. Mr. Desmond Lee? Slow, we uh, heard you mention uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Nathan uh, repeatedly, mm. and uh, you had gone uh, on various meetings together with him to yeah. uh, speak to Ms. Khan, mm. um, whether on Zoom or physically, as well as to meet uh, senior party leaders and, of course, with the DP. Mm. Uh, we're hearing his name for the first time. Would you be able to provide his full name and contact details if we do need to contact him? Yeah, I can, but may I also be allowed to speak with him about this? Because um, personally, I wasn't um, in the process of everything. I didn't expect to be called up um, here. But I can understand how that happened because I'm her secretary assistant. But for Mr. Nathan, um, you know, I, I would like to give him some heads up. Yeah. I Ms. Lo, so I think in, in the context uh, of the, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, I think the proceedings in the Community of Privilege should be kept confidential. Okay. I understand your dilemma. Yeah. And we really appreciate the fact that you have been as forthcoming, as honest as you can be. And I understand the uh, emotional burden you bear because you are trying to share the truth as you know it. But it also means sharing 
confidential confid uh, con conversations you have had with people whom you have discussed issues with. Um, but as I explained, the purpose of this is to understand the context because it is an issue of grave, uh, it's a grave matter. And to understand the reasons why Ms. Khan did what she did. And I think what you have shared has been important and useful. And I think by extension, uh, Mr. Nathan would be able to contribute to that. Uh, and I think we would, my own sense is that we would contact him to invite him to come before a committee of privilege to also. Uh, to be interviewed. Mm. Uh, but as with all uh, conversations within a committee of privilege, it is meant to be kept confidential. Okay. So I, while I understand your concerns, uh, but you're not, what has uh, transpired here should not be discussed with anyone else. I understand. Um, yeah, I just want to give him a bit of heads up. I've, I, I think he will be definitely willing to come. It's just... You know, PDPA, I don't want to share his details without asking him first. <laughs> may, may, I, may I just suggest this? I, I, know, I know the usual rules, but I also understand Ms. Lowe's position. And so I just wonder whether, Chairman, we would uh, indulge Ms. Lowe and say you can give him a heads up that he will be called, but please do not discuss anything else about the evidence you okay. had with him. Yeah, no Any that. of the questions, any of the points that you have raised. Okay. The reason for this is we also don't want any suggestion that he has been influenced by you. I understand yeah, that. And that okay. That's really for the protection of the integrity of the entire process. Um, okay. I mean, I'm just trying to do the right thing, um, but... Which we appreciate. Yeah, but um, I, I think I can just provide you the details after this because um, at some point, because Yudish, I'm going to use this, you know, why I refer to Yudish, um, we have been involved in this you know, almost from the beginning. We have obviously discussed this between the two of us a little bit. And when it came to my realization, prior to receiving the email from Parliament, I, I did realize that I might be called um, to provide evidence. We, we did, you know, animate that perhaps he would need to back me up. Lah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think he's ready. Yeah, I mean, he's willing to come. I won't say he's ready, but he's willing, but... Yeah, I mean, I can give you his details okay, after. Okay. I just wanted to, you know, do the right thing by asking him first. I understand. So I think please do uh, let him know, but as uh, mentioned by Minister Edwin Tong, perhaps not the details. Okay. Um, would there be any other individuals or persons of interest you feel would be able to contribute to our committee's better understanding of this? Uh, no, Mr. Nardin's the only one. Hmm. I understand. Mr. Chairman, may I just raise Mr. a point? Uh, Ms. Lo, you had mentioned in response to Ms. Evan Tong's earlier questions that you were prepared to produce some material to uh, to corroborate the points that you've made and also to help refresh uh, your memory because you didn't take down all the dates and yeah. times and you wanted to be as accurate as you could, um, whether you could provide that uh, expediently so that we can uh, proceed with the relevant timelines and information. Okay, can I just clarify that um, can I just share the parts that are only relevant and not like, you yes. know... Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, because, again, as a lot of... Yeah. We are, we are, I mean, I'm 30, I'm 30 years old this year, but, we, you know, our chatter can be quite mindless sometimes, so, yeah. I'm almost twice your age and so, so it's mindless. Okay, I mean, really? yeah, That's I want to keep things, you know, <laughs> private if I can. No, of yeah. no please Ms. do. Ms. Lo, we appreciate that and we respect that. Okay. So we leave it to you to sift through, but please do give us anything that concerns the subject matters that we've talked right, about. All right, I will. Today. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other further questions from members? Okay, then being no other further questions for now, um, would there be a need for us to deliberate and just hold Ms. Lo back I think temporarily? she would not be a complete complete yet until she has provided that. So I suggest that we don't formally discharge yet from the from the attendance. But of course, Ms. Stowe is free to go now. Okay. All right. No, this is just more from a formality perspective. I understand. I mean, May I it. clarify how am I supposed to provide this evidence? Uh, our parliamentary staff will uh, contact you. All and right. then we will gather the, we'll give you the instructions on okay. what the, and the forms and so on. Okay. And of course, the contact for Mr. Nathan. Okay. So if there being no further questions for now, I think we would just like to really thank you for coming before the committee. And as mentioned earlier, I know it's not easy, but we appreciate your being very forthcoming and yeah. sharing with us. Uh, I think has been helpful. A transcript of the proceedings will be shared with you for your own verification. Okay. So please do go through it. 
And if you have any other minor amendments, please make the changes and send the transcripts back to us. Um, please also note that the transcripts and any evidence given to the committee are not to be disclosed to anyone or published and must be kept strictly confidential until the committee has presented its report to Parliament, meaning that obviously you are not to discuss what transpired here with anybody else as well. Okay. Uh, I just want to confirm, not even my family, right? Like, not my husband? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, yes. Uh, so, you may withdraw for now, but uh, do please remain in Parliament House. Uh, and we, we don't need to hold you back further, because we won't be calling you back later. But if should we be need to, or the later date, we will let you know. And uh, our staff will inform you of the relevant documents to be collected. And okay. So, just to clarify, I have to stay here today? No, no, no. I don't think she needs to stay here, but no. oh. I just wonder whether you could, uh, in fact, try and shortly after lunch attend to the documents so that we could have them and then we don't okay. have to end up being protracted here. So I would really appreciate if you could do that okay. quickly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So our staff will accompany you to the waiting room. So once again, thank you very much, Ms. Lo. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Lo. Sergeant Adams, please accompany Do I keep these? Oh, so you can leave them here. You leave okay. them. You should not, should not take them. Thank you. Chairman, while Mr. Uh, while Ms. Lowe takes her leave, I realise I didn't mark all the exhibits, so maybe later I'll work with the club to label them so that sure. we have a reference point. Okay, okay. Thank, you. I can do that. thank you very Thank you very much, Ms. Lowe.